By the time the sun rose on a new year, January 1st, 1945, the situation was looking desperate. For the German and Hungarian defenders of Budapest, supply lines were running dry. Ferrogi Airport, a critical asset for the defenders, had fallen on December 27th. The Danube River had frozen, extinguishing the hope of resupply by barge. Hitler had already declared Budapest a fortress city, stating that it must be defended to the last man. The city was now well and truly under siege. For the Russians outside Budapest, there was no mood for mercy. Memories of Stalingrad, of Leningrad and of countless other bloody battles and sieges on Soviet soil saw to that. They would taste victory at all costs. Either the defenders would hand over the city to them or there would be a heavy toll to pay for resistance. In the end, it was the latter option. The Axis units at Budapest held out until mid-February 1945 fighting on and refusing to give in until the bitter end. In the panicked final hours, soldiers and civilians would attempt to escape. Some would make it, thousands would be cut down in the attempt, and as the Soviet forces moved in to take their latest prize, they would find entire Axis divisions destroyed. The 22nd SS Volunteer Cavalry Division Maria Theresia, the 8th SS Cavalry Division Florian Gaia, the 1st Hungary Corps, among others, almost annihilated. World War I was human conflict at its most horrific, its most heinously terrifying. It was also human conflict taken to an industrial scale. If the First World War fed brave troops into meat grinders during futile assaults, the Second World War did the same thing but with the pretense of sophistication. The first truly modern war, perhaps, but a slaughter by any other name is still a slaughter. Annihilation is still annihilation. In this video, we're going to be telling the stories of those units at the Siege of Budapest and of many others that were destroyed over the course of the war. If there is no surrender, there's only victory or destruction. Before diving into the brutal Pacific theater of World War II, a quick shout out to our sponsor NordVPN. A key factor in the Allied victory in the Pacific was cracking Japanese naval codes, allowing them to anticipate Japanese plans and win decisive battles, particularly at Midway. Similarly, lacking protection for your sensitive information can leave you vulnerable. That's where NordVPN comes in. With NordVPN, you become safer online with just one click. NordVPN's mission is to make the internet a better place than it is today, free from online threats, censorship, and surveillance. Using NordVPN is simple. Just hit the quick connect button in the app and you'll be connected to the best server available. You can also customize your connection with presets for download, speed, or browsing. The NordVPN boosts my research by allowing me to access local sources, gaining a more grounded and authentic insight into the topics we're covering. NordVPN also offers advanced digital protection with Threat Protection Pro, shielding you from malware and online threats. For added peace of mind, NordVPN's dark web monitor scans hacker forums to alert you if your credentials are up for sale. Also check out their newest service, Sali, a new eSIM service app with affordable plans in over 150 countries, ensuring you always have a connection. Sali's eSIM saves on roaming fees and offers reliable internet wherever you go. Install it once and use it across multiple locations, saving time and hassle. Check out my link below for an exclusive NordVPN deal, plus up to 20 gigabytes Sali eSIM data here at nordvpn.com com slash the front. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Stay secure and enjoy a better version of the internet with NordVPN. Click the link below to get started today. The brutal events of June 6, 1944 and the heroic capture of the landing areas on the beaches of Normandy by Allied troops are often thought of as the beginning of the end of the war in Europe. There's quite a lot wrong with this oversimplified view and there was a hell of a lot more fighting to do. Many of Germany's best units were still in the field, and they weren't going down without a fight. Among these units was the 3rd Parachute Division. A Luftwaffe unit, these hardened paratroopers knew how to fight. When they arrived in Normandy on June 10th, they were ready to make life difficult for the Allies. Those Germans are the best damn soldiers I ever saw, an American commander would say of the new opponents. They're smart and they don't know what fear means. They come in and they keep coming until they get their job done or you kill them. Or you kill them. This would be the objective, but it would not come easily. 
First of all, this was a full strength unit, numbering almost 16,000 men. It was incredibly well drilled and equipped with formidable weaponry. The division was also commanded by Lieutenant General Richard Shrimp, a highly effective soldier and First World War veteran. With a beachhead established at Normandy, the Allies began their dogged breakout across northern France. The 3rd Parachute Division inflicted heavy losses on the invaders, but already the supply chain had begun to break down. The 3rd Parachute's motorized vehicles had not been delivered, severely hindering their mobility. The division resorted to commandeering vehicles from locals, but this proved to be insufficient. What's more, the division came under punishing assaults from the Allies, as aerial bombardments and shelling took a heavy toll on the 3rd Parachute's ranks. By mid-August, the division was part of a large contingent of German troops pinned down within the infamous Falaise Pocket, and the trap sprung by British, American, Canadian and Polish Allied troops was about to swing shut. During one last breakout attempt from Falaise on August 20th, General Schrimpf was severely wounded by a 20mm shell. He was removed from the field, hospitalized, but would survive. Thousands of his soldiers would not be so lucky. The following day, the Falaise pocket was sealed and the fighting in this part of France was over. The 3rd Parachute Division was shattered almost completely, its former combatants strewn lifeless across the French countryside. Charlemagne, the great 8th century king of the Franks, the people for whom modern day France takes its name, ruler of the Holy Roman Empire from the seat of Aachen, modern day Germany. A great unifier in what has frequently been a fractured and unharmonious history. The perfect name for a French unit fighting within the German army. Also known as the 33rd Waffengrenadier Division of the SS, Charlemagne was a unit from Vichy, France, fighting under the tricolor flag, but an integral part of the Waffen SS German fighting force. The Vichy Division fought well, it fought hard, and it refused to give up even when all seemed lost. Berlin, April 30th, 1945. Adolf Hitler is dead. With defeat assured, he put a bullet in his own head rather than face his captors. Soviet forces, still eager to avenge their own sickening losses at the hands of the Germans in the previous years, are advancing on Berlin. The Blitzkrieg, swift, brutal, decisive, is a distant memory, and Germany is on its knees. One of the commonly held images of Berlin at the end of the war is a ragtag army. Kids, elderly people, the sick and infirm in a desperate attempt to stop the Soviet advance. This is true to an extent, but there were battle-hardened units there too. Units like Charlemagne. By the end of April though, they were battered, broken, beaten down. What had been a unit of more than 7,000 men had come close to destruction during the East Pomeranian Offensive of February 1945, as Soviet troops pushed through Poland and into Prussia. A small contingent of these men regrouped and fell back to Berlin, where they were commanded by Henri Joseph Fenet. Whether or not the men of the Charlemagne Division knew of Hitler's death, of the breakdown of command, of the irresistible Allied advance and Axis capitulation all over Europe, we don't know. But they would have known what they saw, a city in ruins, Littered with bodies, the red Soviet flags, the T-34 tanks, the victorious voices calling out in Russian. Their own dwindling ranks. They would have seen the end coming. But still, they fought on. On April 30th, Fenet and his SS brigade ran guerrilla sorties out among the smashed masonry and cratered streets on tank hunting missions, taking out 21 of the machines while suffering heavy casualties of their own. The next morning would be a bleak one for Charlemagne. Only around 30 men remained, and they were starving, wounded, and facing defeat. This was it. They'd split into two groups and attempt their escape from the stricken city. Many would surrender to the Red Army before they even made it out of Berlin, but some escaped, including Fenet. But the situation outside Berlin was just as futile. Fenet, along with just a few of his men, surrendered to British forces soon after their escape. Some of the division's few survivors were handed over to the Russians. 
These were the lucky ones. Those who were handed back to their French compatriots were shot as traitors. Charlemagne numbered around 7,340 men in February 1945. Three months later, only 300 remained alive to defend Berlin. All but a handful would perish here. In the cloying heats of the desert, beset by dust and dirt and grime, the hull of a tank can swiftly become a coffin. At the Second Battle of El Alamein 1942, the 21st Panzer Division would discover the wicked truth of this as their vehicles went from mobile bastions to death chambers in the face of the Allied advance. Things had started well for the Germans. The British were in disarray in North Africa. After repelling an invasion of Egypt from Italian Libya, the British forces found themselves struggling to achieve the same superiority in the Sahara when General Erwin Rommel and his German forces stepped into the fray in spring 1941. The British army was pushed back into Egypt, finding itself routed by the brilliance of Rommel and his divisions. At El Alamein, however, they made their stand, taking advantage of a narrow strip of land bordered by the sea to the north and the impassable Katara depression to the south. July 1942. In soaring temperatures and hellish conditions, the British stopped the Axis advance. Axis and Allied bodies littered the sands, shattered shells of tanks smoldered in the dust. The affair had been a bloody stalemate, but that was all the British needed. They began to regroup. Commanders Harold Alexander and Bernard Montgomery bolstered their forces, ready to drive the Axis powers back westwards across the desert. Rommel was no fool. He saw what was to come. His plan was an audacious one, to advance into Egypt, squeezing the Allied forces until the Germans at Stalingrad could declare victory in the east and put Persia under threat. Rommel's plan would never be enacted. On October 23rd, the British attack began. The 21st Panzer was stationed on the south side of the battlefield beside the Italian 132nd Arieta Division. Looking eastwards into Egypt, they may have seen the Allied positions. The British 50th Infantry alongside the Greek Brigade, with more British units and a free French division to the south. The following day, the 21st, would see action, surging southeast along with the 132nd Arieta to reinforce the Italian lines under Allied assault. On October 25th, Allied troops changed their tack. They decided to concentrate their efforts on the 185th Folgore Division in the Italian front line, attacking from three directions and inflicting heavy casualties. And yet still, there was no breakthrough. Finally, on the afternoon of the 26th, there was a breakthrough, but it was to the north. The 51st Highlanders had taken Kidney Ridge. New Zealander, Australian and South African regiments were advancing. The Axis line could be breaking. Frantically, the mobile 21st Panzer was redeployed to the north. They engaged the Highlanders on Kidney Ridge along with the 15th Panzer and 133rd Littorio, but it was a futile effort. The dogged Scotsmen refused to budge, and the 21st Panzer sensed the battle slipping from their grasp. The fighting was now most intensive in the north, and the 21st Panzer defending the railway line was taking the brunt of it. First, on Halloween 1942, Australian troops attempted a breakthrough. In danger of being overpowered, the 21st Panzer managed to hold out. Then, two days later, the tank battle of Tel Akir, a last chance to halt the Allied advance. Shattered, exhausted, running on empty, the 21st Panzer engaged once again, Rommel banking everything on what remained of his best units. But by now, the momentum had shifted in favor of the Allies. The rout began. The 21st Panzer was destroyed, along with the Italian Trento, Bologna and Arieta divisions. The heroes of Rommel's Panzer divisions, the armored war horses of North Africa, littered the landscape, their once formidable tanks now blackened, lifeless tombs to be reclaimed by the desert sands. The final weeks of 1941 were a desperate scramble for United States forces. The surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th had just been the beginning. 
and Imperial Japanese forces unleashed hell on Southeast Asia, tearing through Thailand, Malaya, and the Philippines. The USA was now a part of the global conflict, but already it was in danger of losing vital bases in the Pacific, not least in the Philippines. On Boxing Day, the 4th Marine Regiment was deployed in the island of Corregidor in Manila Bay, ready to defend the Filipino capital. They believed their position to be a good one. Captain John Clark would later describe the sense of optimism that came over the troops. A feeling of safety and security came over us as we reached the rock, he wrote. We were told it was impregnable and that we had nothing to fear from Japanese attack. But Japanese bombing raids soon began to shatter this illusion. As 1942 dawned, the 4th Marines found themselves under an intense assault as Japanese planes hammered the position. Then, just like that, the assaults abated, but only temporarily. By the time February rolled around, period Japanese raids were commonplace and these attacks intensified as the Japanese continued their advance across the archipelago. The 4th Marines weren't sitting idly by. They were reinforcing, preparing themselves for whatever might come their way. On April 9th, Bataan fell, and the Japanese troops under General Homa turned their attentions to Manila and Corregidor. The showdown with the 4th Marines Regiment was imminent. It was almost another month, May 5th, by the time the first Japanese forces landed on Corregidor, ready for the final assault. The arrival was heralded by intense shelling. The Marines and their Filipino comrades were ready for the invaders. What followed was nothing short of horrific. A spectacle that confounded the imagination, an observer would say, surpassing in grim horror anything we had ever seen before. The Japanese had the weight of numbers on their side, as well as the weight of hardware. Waves of invaders poured onto the island, pushing the defenders back. On the slopes of the Denver Battery Hill, the Marines made a stand, stalling the invaders with vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The counterattack was a scene of unbelievable heroism from the Americans and from the Filipinos fighting alongside them. Lieutenant Otter of the 4th Marines took a group of soldiers and knocked out a heavy Japanese machine gun pit, scoring a significant victory for the Allied forces, but it would not last. A group of Japanese soldiers coming up from the rear overwhelmed Otter and his men, leaving no survivors. By 4.30 a.m. on May 6, the defenders' ranks were dwindling. The night had exacted a heavy toll on the 4th Marines and other units on the island. Sniper fire cut the Allies down where they stood. Redeployment and resupply seemed impossible. An hour later, more Japanese reinforcements landed, followed by three tanks at 9.30 a.m. The situation was now impossible. Sheltering in a concrete trench, sustaining horrendous fire from Japanese artillery, the few survivors of the 4th Marine Regiment made a difficult decision. There's a limit of human endurance, the Marine Commander, Lieutenant General Jonathan Wainwright, said in a message to President Roosevelt. And that point has long been passed. The surviving Marines surrendered at Corregidor at 1.30pm that same day. Cisterna, Italy, 1944. Allied forces landing at Ansio can't go anywhere while the town of Cisterna di Lotoria remains in enemy hands. Not for the first time in this war, and not for the last, it falls to the Rangers to lead the way. The 1st and 3rd Battalions would go first, followed by the 4th Rangers and the 3rd Battalion 15th Infantry Regiment. Penetrating behind enemy lines, 1st and 3rd Rangers began their assault in the early hours of the morning. Shrouded in darkness, the units navigated through German positions, but the growing daylight caught them off guard. Suddenly exposed, the Rangers were set upon by a dawn counterattack from the 715th Infantry Division, supported by Panzer tanks. The Rangers knew there were Germans in the area, but they had no idea how many. The Axis had brought in reinforcements just the previous evening, and the Rangers were woefully outmanned and outgunned. The Rangers' 1st Battalion Commander, 
Major Jack Dobson was said to have taken out one of the Panthers personally, armed with a pistol and a white phosphorus grenade, before being wounded in action. Major Alva Miller of the 3rd Battalion would be killed. 1st and 3rd Rangers held out in the knowledge that the 4th Battalion was not far behind. Right across the Ansio perimeter, Allied defensive units attacked, seeking to break the German lines and rescue the stricken Rangers. All three battalions sustained heavy casualties. First and third suffered 12 killed, 36 wounded, and 743 captured. Fourth Rangers lost 30 souls, with 58 wounded. The Rangers had fought with staggering bravery, but their deployment on such a mission drew criticism. Whether rightly or wrongly deployed, the Rangers ceased to be an effective fighting force in Italy and the battalions were disbanded after the Battle of Cisterna. This brings us back to Hungary, to Budapest, and to two great armies on very different trajectories. Beyond the boundaries of the city, we have the Soviet Red Army, pushed back almost to obliteration in 1942, and now driving westwards toward the German heartlands. Within the Hungarian capital, the Axis forces are holding out. Once all conquering and on the offensive, now very much on the back foot. Even by February 1945, when all seemed hopeless, Hitler ordered the Axis troops to remain. Budapest must stay strong. And yet, the resupply from outside the city, already struggling under the strain, had all but dried up. The battered defenders of the city were told to stand firm and face death for a cause that had essentially abandoned them. By February 11th, the Axis will was broken. Soldiers began to flee, withdrawing from their positions and pushing through snow and ice to what they hoped would be safety. It was not safety. Under cover of darkness and wrapped in bitter cold, the Soviet troops lay in wait around Sekelman Square. What is now a thriving transport hub in the charming city of Budapest became the scene of a desperate struggle for survival. The first wave of fleeing Axis soldiers, with civilians among them, masked their movements in the rolling fog that hung over the square. Many would reach safety. But now, the Soviets were ready. They poured a heavy fire on the following waves, and thousands died in their desperate bid for escape. To the north of the city, the Maria Theresia Waffen SS division was attempting one last breakout. The steely resolve that had brought them this far remained, and they began to drive through the Russian lines to the very limits of the city in the forlorn hope of linking up with other German regiments. The Soviet armored divisions who witnessed this response were unmoved. They seized the advantage and wiped the Maria Theresia from the face of the earth. Both the 1st Hungarian Corps and the Florian Gaia SS cavalry were similarly dispatched woefully under-equipped to face a confident Red Army after such a long time under siege. In total, the encirclement of Budapest lasted for 102 days, far longer than the sieges of Berlin and Vienna and far more brutal for the local civilian population even than Leningrad and Stalingrad. More than 100,000 civilians, one-eighth of the city's population, perished due to fighting, starvation, execution, and forced labor. Another 38,000 Axis troops and 80,000 Soviets would also be killed in the city. Budapest, a city of culture and beauty and one of the most popular city break destinations in Europe, bore witness to almighty carnage and bloodshed in the war's final year. Carnage and bloodshed that, outside of Hungary at least, has been largely forgotten. The Second World War brings us stories of unimaginable suffering and tragedy, but also heroism. On both sides, soldiers fought with bravery and selflessness, finding themselves in situations most could never, or hopefully could never, even begin to imagine. Whether through receiving the wrong orders, making the wrong call, or simply being in the wrong place at the wrong time, entire divisions of these soldiers were sometimes wiped from the map. We've told a few of these stories today, but there's plenty more. The chaos of the beaches, the scrambled rescue attempt, the mobilization of civilian ships and boats, Prime Minister Winston Churchill delivering his immortal speech to the House of Commons, 
We know, or at least we think we know, quite a bit about the evacuation of Dunkirk in 1940. The action that was at once both a crushing defeat and a vital lifeline for the British Army in Europe. Perhaps less well known are the stories of those who never made it to the beaches. The units ordered to stay behind and prevent a German advance that could annihilate Allied forces before they even had a chance to make it home. Thousands of British and French soldiers stood, fought and died side by side in the villages and countryside of northern France in May and June of 1940. The second battalion of the Royal Norfolk Regiment was among them. As May 1940 entered its final week, the men of the 2nd Battalion would have understood the magnitude of the task they faced. In the villages of Le Paradis, Le Connemal and Ria du Vénage, the Norfolks held their ground. Charged with forming roadblocks and holding off the German advance, it's possible that the Norfolks had already recognized the true nature of their mission. They would be facilitating the rescue of thousands of British troops, but no such rescue would be coming for them. By May 27th, this would have become all too clear. Cut off from their battalion headquarters, with no hope of resupply, their ammunition ran out. With nothing to throw at the advancing Germans, the remaining 97 men of the 2nd Norfolks could do nothing but surrender. The 2nd SS Tottenkopf or Death's Head Regiment, a unit notorious for its ruthlessness and brutality, accepted the surrender but did not accept the men as prisoners. Instead, the Norfolks had their weapons and identity badges ripped from them and were marched out into open farmland where machine guns were waiting. Here, the 97 were torn to pieces by machine gun fire in a mass execution before revolvers and bayonets finished the job. Miraculously, two of the men did survive, were sheltered by sympathetic locals, and were eventually captured by less brutal German units. They would survive the war. Their comrades would be hastily buried by the French villagers under the observation of the occupying German troops. Today, they lie in La Paradis Cemetery in a section designated as a war grave site. The massacre was part of the systematic eradication of British troops from northern France. On the same day the 2nd Norfolks met their end, the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment surrendered at Warmhout. The Warwickshires were forced into a nearby barn by their German captors who tossed hand grenades in after them. The two survivors of Le Paradis would eventually have a small piece of revenge. In January 1949, following a testimony from surviving Norfolk soldier Bill O'Callaghan, the German officer who had ordered the massacre was sentenced to death. Fritz Knöchlein would atone for his crime at the end of a hangman's rope. This likely offered only scant comfort to the families of those unarmed men gunned down in a French field one day in May 1940. They were known as the Texas Battalion because they were formed from the Texas National Guard. But in October 1944, the men of the 1st Battalion, 141st Infantry Regiment of the 36th Division found themselves a long way from home. Deep in the Vosges region of eastern France, some four months on from D-Day, advance units were clearing a path for the Allied main force on their way to the German border. But in this rugged, mountainous landscape, they were met with dogged resistance from German units. Special forces operations here had been moderately successful, but there was still a huge job to do, and the Texas Battalion was one of the units that had to do it. Major General John E. Dahlquist was convinced of success, but his senior officers were not so sure. The general decided to execute his plan anyway, sending the 1st Battalion forward into the Vosges to clear a strategic ridge held by German troops. The battalion, perhaps overstretched, perhaps sent in prematurely to capture a hopeless objective, found themselves cut off. Major General Dalquist ordered the units to withdraw, but in the unforgiving terrain of the Vosges, these orders only reached the flanking units. The 1st Battalion never received this word to retreat, and by the time they realized they were without flanking support, they were completely cut off. There were 275 men trapped in the Verge, encircled by enemy troops. Their countrymen and the 141st Infantry's other battalions failed to reach them. The 405th Fighter Squadron did reach them, but could only keep them resupplied as repeated rescue attempts were pushed back by staunch German resistance. Time was running out for the Texans. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team was enjoying a well-earned rest period 
after their hard-fought victories at Bourrier and Bifontin. Liberating the towns had come at a heavy cost, but this rest period would be cut short when they received the call from General Dalquist. The 275 men trapped in the Vosges were in desperate need of rescue. The 442nd was an unusual unit. These soldiers were Nisai, a Japanese term literally meaning second generation, referring to those of Japanese descent who were born in the US, and they had been segregated from other units in the American armed forces. While their family members and loved ones back home waited out the war in internment camps as symbols of distrust for many Americans, the men of the 442nd fought with incredible valor, taking enormous casualties in service of a country that viewed them with suspicion. By October 26th, the 2nd and 3rd battalions of the 141st Infantry were exhausted, while their brothers of the 1st remained pinned down. The 442nd arrived to relieve the ailing troops, and a remarkable five-day campaign began. The Nisai American soldiers fought with the courage and resilience that had become their trademark, reaching the Texans on October 30th. Incredibly, they rescued 211 men, suffering over 800 casualties in the process. Even this was not enough for the men of the 442nd. A detachment of around 50 troops of the regiment ran a daring mission in the hope of outflanking German troops in the Vosges and rescuing the remaining Texans from the rear. This move was a valiant failure, and all but five of these rescuers were killed or taken prisoner. The captured 442nd troops would eventually be freed in April 1945 when their prison camp at Moosburg fell. When the size of the regiment and the length of its service are taken into account, no American unit of the war received more medals than the 442nd. The 100th Infantry Battalion, of which the 442nd was a part, would become known as the Purple Heart Battalion because of its vast numbers of wounded. The men of the 1st Battalion, 141st Infantry, on the other hand, would become known as the Lost Battalion, named for those few days in October 1944 when they were swallowed by the Vosges Mountains and all but wiped out by the German troops they found there. When Australian troops landed on the Bismarck Archipelago, New Guinea, in 1914, occupying this far-flung outpost of the German Empire, it may have seemed like a sideshow to the conflict unfolding in Europe. Certainly, the slaughter of Gallipoli the following year has consigned the New Guinea action, rightly or wrongly, to the status of a footnote in Australia's First World War history. In 1941, however, Australia's situation would have felt a little more urgent. Growing Japanese ambitions in the Pacific made Australia nervous. An expansion southwards might threaten the nation itself and would certainly put the territory she administered in New Britain in harm's way, as well as the civilians who lived and worked there. In March and April, the 2-22nd Battalion was sent to Rabol, New Britain, to set up a small but strategically crucial garrison. They would become known as Lark Force. If the outbreak of war in December 1941 left Prime Minister John Curtin unsurprised, the speed of Japan's advance might have caught him a little off guard. On January 4th, 1942, less than a month after war was declared, a massive campaign of aerial bombing brought Japanese fury raining down on Rabaul. Wing Commander John Leroux operated a Royal Australian Air Force unit in the area, running reconnaissance missions out of Lakunai and Vunakanao but his small force of four Hudson aircraft and ten Wirraways was almost destroyed in the onslaught. Finding themselves in the back foot, the Australian commander ordered the remaining RAAF crews to withdraw, tearing up the airfields as they left. By the early hours of January 23rd, a Japanese invasion force of more than 5,000 men was pouring onto the island. Spread thinly across the coast at Rabaul, Lark Force struggled to resist. The Japanese landed almost unopposed in many sectors, while an aerial bombardment inflicted punishing damage on the defenders. Rabol and the surrounding area would be in Japanese hands long before dawn rose on the 24th. 76 officers and some 1,314 men of various ranks had defended Rabol, and around 300 Australian civilians, including six nurses attached to Lark Force, were also caught up in the invasion. Two of the officers and 26 men were killed in the initial fighting, while around 400 fled into the thick jungle of New Britain, braving brutal terrain as they sought to evade capture. One of the 400 was Barney Kane, 
who served with the 17th Anti-Tank Battery. Speaking in 2021, Barney, who is from Rye, Victoria, and is believed to be the last surviving member of Lark Force, described his remarkable experiences as he dodged Japanese patrols and battled the elements. We were running from the Japanese, and you had one thing on your mind. Feet, do your duty, he said. It would be three and a half months before Barney and his comrades arrived at Port Moresby, where they were shipped back to Australia. Many of the remnants of Lark Force would not be so lucky, and those captured found that surrender was no guarantee of safety. Japanese abuse of Allied prisoners of war is well documented, but what happened at the Toll Plantation in February 1942 is a horrifying and oft-forgotten chapter in this story of misery. At Toll, around 160 survivors of the defense of Rabaul were put to death. Some were shot, others died at the point of a bayonet blade. The handful of men who survived the atrocity at Toll would later testify against their captors after the war in a court of inquiry. Other captives would perish for very different reasons. A large number of the 800 prisoners were loaded into the Montevideo Maru transport ship ready to be taken to Japanese prison camps. When a US submarine encountered the Montevideo Maru and saw its Japanese livery, the sub opened fire, sealing the fate of most of the ship's crew and their prisoners. Colonel Kionao Echiki, commander of the elite and experienced 28th Infantry Regiment, had an idea. It was a bold and risky idea, but if successful, it would see the Japanese forces seize Henderson Field and tip the balance of the Guadalcanal campaign in their favor. And so, just after midnight on August 21st, 1942, the first wave of the Japanese attack traversed the slope on the eastern bank of the Tanaru and began their advance across a sandbar to the enemy positions on the other side. In his war memoir, Helmet for My Pillow, Robert Leckie likened the Tanaru River to a serpent, green and evil. It was not a river at all, in Leckie's estimation, but a creek and sometimes not even that because it didn't always flow, separated as it was from the ocean by a spit of sand some 40 feet wide. It was this spit of sand the 28th Infantry now advanced across. It was a matter of minutes before the battalion commanders on the Tanaru understood the magnitude of the mistake. Like crimson blossoms was how one soldier described the American machine gun fire that poured down on the four columns as they advanced. Bright as searchlights. As the cloying sand gave way beneath their feet, the Japanese soldiers presented an easy target to the gunners on the west bank. Al Schmid, an assistant gunner for the 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, described the assault as like a bunch of cows coming down to drink. Watching on, appalled from the east bank, 2nd Company Commander Captain Tetsuro Sawada sent a runner to find out just what the hell was going on at the American line. The runner, barely escaping with his own life, reported that the officer leading the charge, Lieutenant Ohashi, lay gravely wounded on the other side, along with most of his men. There were American casualties. Some of the 28th had survived the assault, knocking out gun emplacements and killing some of the American defenders. The situation, however, was hopeless. A reserve American detachment was mopping up the few Japanese who had broken through, and most of the wave lay wounded or dead in the creek on the western bank. The 28th must retreat. Barely an hour and a half into August 21st, the first Japanese attack had been shattered by the Marines on the west bank of the Tenaru. And yet, Colonel Ichiki was unwilling to change his tactics. At 2.30 a.m., the second wave attacked, and between 150 and 250 more Japanese soldiers were fed into the meat grinder, stumbling over the corpses of their fallen brothers in the shallows before they, too, fell to American machine gun fire. But Ichiki believed victory was still within reach. Regrouping to the east of the Tenaru, the Japanese troops let fly with mortar rounds, attempting to soften up the American positions for a third assault. The Americans responded with fire of their own, and more Japanese fell. At 5 a.m., Ichiki ordered a third assault. This time, the men of the 28th would bypass the sandbar, wading westwards through the ocean waves and launching an assault further up the beach. Again, this was repulsed with massive casualties. 
As dawn rose and the winter light illuminated the bloody mess at the mouth of the Tenaru, now choked with corpses, the surviving Japanese soldiers must have felt as if they had already endured a lifetime's worth of hell on August 21st. And yet, the day was just beginning. As the Japanese target of Henderson Field still lay in Allied hands, the Americans began flying sorties from the airstrip, strafing the 28th Infantry as they scrambled for cover. American tanks were ordered across the sandbar, breaking out onto the Japanese side and shattering the pockets of resistance that remained there. By 5 p.m., 12 hours after the final desperate Japanese assault, the battle was over. Sometime on that chaotic day, Colonel Kionao Ichiki had lost his life, perhaps killed by American fire or perhaps committing ritual seppuku suicide, now fully understanding that his bold decision had been a catastrophic error. The colonel would just be one of around 800 Japanese soldiers who laid down their lives where the Tenaru River meets the sea. Had everything gone to plan, the Vicenza would likely never have been on the front lines at all. The 156th Infantry Division was deployed in eastern Ukraine as a reserve unit, keeping communication lines clear for the troops in advanced positions. But this was January 1943 on the Eastern Front, and for the Axis, nothing was going to plan. With the German 6th Army surrounded and facing defeat at Stalingrad, the Soviet forces were able to turn their attention to the Axis troops on the Don River. The task of smashing these forces, largely Italian and Hungarian divisions, fell to General Filip Golikov's men, who were happy to oblige after the misery of autumn and early winter 1942. Golikov's men succeeded in pushing back the already weakened German 24th Army Corps, all but destroying the Hungarian 2nd Army at Svoboda. Between these two positions were the Alpini, Italy's Alpine Army Corps. The Alpini were highly capable troops, able to fight even in the most difficult of terrain. But their commander, General Gabriel Nassai, knew they could not hold off the Soviets alone, and on January 17th, he ordered his divisions to fall back. The retreat was a desperate one. Some 40,000 men, mainly Alpini and the remnants of other Italian divisions, but with Germans and Hungarians among them too, beat a disordered retreat back to the west and relative safety of the Axis lines. But to reach the line, they must break through the Soviet forces would close the pincers on them to the west. On January 25th, Soviet artillery fire squeezed the remaining columns, limiting their options for escape. Their only chance of survival lay at the village of Nikolevka, where the Soviet 48th Guards Rifle Division stood in their way. On the morning of the 26th, the 1st Alpini divisions reached the village. The Italians, now desperate, launched an attack, avoiding the Russian fortifications on either flank with a frontal assault. Ground was hard fought and hard won, but the Italians made progress, pushing into the village and coming tantalizingly close to the breakout that would offer some hope of salvation. As the day wore on and the light began to fade, General Luigi Revaberi of the Tridentina Division ordered a last gasp assault. It would be a human wave attack, bringing whatever force the remaining Italians could muster down on the 48th Guards. Somehow, it was a success. At Nikolevka, the Alpini punched through the Soviet encirclement and pushed on to rejoin the Axis lines beyond. January 26th would go down as an Italian victory of sorts, although the only victory was an escape from complete annihilation. However, not all the Italian divisions at Nikolevka would be granted this reprieve. Initially held in reserve, the 156th Infantry Division was closer to full strength than most of the other Alpini units. First caught up in the retreat, and then snared by the Soviet encirclement, the Vicenza now found themselves not just at the enemy lines, but also behind them. The men fought bravely, desperate to push on with their compatriots to the resupply area, but here, the Soviet line was stronger, and the exhausted division found themselves cut off. On the afternoon of January 6th, some four kilometers east of the town of Valuki, the Vicenza was annihilated. A handful of men would reach the Axis line days later, but the majority fell to Soviet fire, their bodies littering the borderlands between Russia and Ukraine. In some cases, it was a tactical blunder. Colonel Ichiki's direct assault across Tenaru cost him and his men their lives, 
while Major General John Dalquist went against the advice of his officers and sent his Texas battalion into the jaws of the enemy. In others, the hands of fate and circumstance dealt the cards. The Lark Force was simply too small to mount a meaningful defense against the Imperial troops of Japan sweeping across the Pacific. The Vicenza was never intended to be at the front at all. In all these stories though, there are common threads. Bravery, valor, and extraordinary deeds in extraordinary circumstances. There are lessons to be learned too. War is costly, and often the loser pays the ultimate price. Complete annihilation. As many as 277 Filipino guerrilla forces, composed of more than 260,000 freedom fighters in total, contested the Japanese occupation of the Philippines during the Second World War. Some worked with the United States Army Forces in the Far East, or USA FFE, while others worked alone, or in some cases, even against the Americans. Either way, without their bravery and sacrifice, it's likely Operation Musketeer, in which the Allies returned to the Philippines to end Japanese occupation, would have failed. While we've already discussed Filipino guerrillas in a previous video, one daring assassin managed to evade all of our spotlights. But we've seen her now, and her story is one that needs to be told. In this video, we honor the brave female Filipino guerrilla leader, Nieves Fernandez. Before we delve into Nieves' story, it's worth establishing the stakes. Just what drove her to set aside her blackboard ruler and take up a knife? On the 8th of December 1941, less than half a day after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese began their invasion of the Philippine Islands. Over the next six months, the Filipino and American forces defending the Philippines put up a solid fight, sustaining up to 146,000 casualties, but most were ultimately forced to withdraw or surrender. It should come as no surprise to you that the Allied soldiers who fell into Japanese hands were treated horrendously, made to endure the infamous Bataan Death March, just to name one atrocity. But the Japanese did not reserve their cruelty for Allied soldiers alone. In many cases, Filipino civilians had it worse. Putting aside the infamous February 1945 Manila Massacre, in which 100,000 to 500,000 Filipinos were brutally murdered by the Japanese, hundreds of thousands of civilians suffered and perished throughout the three-year Japanese occupation of the Philippines. Many were wounded or killed, sometimes just for offering food or water to marching allied POWs, while others fell victim to famine, forced labor, and torture. An unfortunate 30-ish Filipino civilians, mostly of Moro Muslims, also fell into the hands of Japanese medical officer Akira Makino, who conducted experiments on them, amputating limbs and dissecting their abdomens. Many women were victims of sexual assault, and more than 1,000 Filipino women were taken as so-called comfort women and held in so-called comfort stations, like Bahaina Pula or the Red House, where they were raped on a daily basis. As per a New York Times editorial from the 6th of March 2007, these were not commercial brothels. Force, explicit and implicit, was used in recruiting these women. What went on inside was serial rape, not prostitution. Knowing that a similar fate might have awaited them if they were captured, this makes the heroic exploits of female Filipino resistance fighters, in particular, all the more inspiring. Despite the risks, some 26,000 female Filipino guerrillas contested the Japanese occupation of the Philippines. But only one woman commanded a guerrilla force of her own. When the Japanese first invaded the Philippines, it's unlikely that Tacloban City-based Filipino schoolteacher Nieves Fernandez knew how the war would shape her life. When they started practicing untold cruelty on innocent civilians, however, her path became clear. In Nieves' own words, when the Japanese came, no one could keep anything. They took everything they wanted. They had ways of persuading, like giving you scalding hot baths and freezing cold baths alternatively with never a rest, never any food, and never any drinking water except the soapy water in the baths. But she wasn't going to let the Japanese take anything from her nor torture her without a fight. Nor was she going to let her students get captured by the enemy who would scarcely differentiate between young girls and adults in their comfort stations. 
Miss Fernandez set aside her ruler and went out into the Philippine province of Leyte, where she rallied as many as 110 Filipinos under one common goal, to kill as many Japanese troops as possible, while also freeing as many women from their inhuman assailants as possible. To those brave Filipino guerrillas, she wasn't Miss Nieves Fernandez, but Captain Nieves Fernandez. Guns, however, don't grow on trees, so Captain Nieves' guerrillas were forced to use improvised weapons, including machete-like bolo knives, paltics or latongs, or homemade gas pipe guns, primarily shotguns loaded with gunpowder and nails, and homemade grenades. They also made good use of captured Japanese weapons and the few American firearms they otherwise acquired. Fernandez was a born marksman, but her favorite way to dispatch Japanese soldiers was with stealth and sharpened steel. Barefoot in a black dress, she would sneak up on an unsuspecting target and thrust her knife into the soft spot behind their earlobe, opening their carotid artery and internal jugular. She would then drive her blade deeper, piercing their brain through which she would twist her blade upwards, making them somehow involuntarily suck in air. Of course, while you're sucking in air, you're unable to scream. Her victims scarcely made a peep as she spilt their blood on the jungle floor. Nieves taught this technique to all of her gorillas and even demonstrated a similar technique. At least, it doesn't look to be the exact same technique on US Army Private Lupiba in this epic photo taken on Leyte Island on the 7th of November 1944. After two and a half years of conducting unconventional warfare behind enemy lines, Fernandez had earned a reputation among both Filipinos and Japanese, so much so that the Japanese placed a 10,000 pesos bounty on her head. Despite this, Fernandez survived the occupation and the war, a single bullet scar on her right forearm to show for it. The Japanese, however, lost more than 200 troops to this school teacher gone rogue and her deadly guerrillas. It's unclear how many rape and would-be rape victims they were able to save, but it was likely many. Much of what we know about Nieves Fernandez comes from a single column published in the Lewiston Daily Sun on the 3rd of November 1944, yet her story is one of the most incredible stories from the Second World War. Her bravery is a testament to the resilience of the Philippines and, to an even greater extent, Filipino women. Other Filipino women fought against the Japanese occupation, albeit not always so directly. Some served in medical roles, tending to wounded guerrillas and escaped allied POWs, while others established underground intelligence networks and counteracted Japanese propaganda. War changes people, but the men who were unlucky enough to liberate Nazi Germany's final solution camps were changed more than most. In this video, we shed light on the liberation of the Second World War's most feared death camps, Dachau and Auschwitz. Like the civilians in Band of Brothers, many Germans claimed they didn't know about the Holocaust when confronted by the Allies. This isn't true. 75 years of historical research has demolished the idea that the average German civilians didn't know what was happening. They knew. When the camps began appearing in the earlier stages of the Nazi regime, news of their construction was reported in the media. Even camp executions were sometimes reported, and the media often blamed prisoners for their own deaths. In the final stages of the war, slave laborers were working in Germany's public spaces, in the factories, and on the streets. It was impossible for a German civilian to be unaware of what was going on, but their views on the atrocities were founded on more than a decade of aggressive Nazi propaganda. For those who weren't willing to go along with the state's crimes, Publicly questioning the regime was dangerous and could have sent you to a concentration camp yourself. This created an environment in Germany where the Nazi crimes were at least tolerated, if not generally accepted. When the Allied armies began advancing into the German heartland, they steadily uncovered more evidence of Nazi crimes against humanity. Soldiers expected to find POW camps and many were aware that camps for Jews and communists were operational too. However, nothing prepared them for what they found. On April 28th, 1945, just two days before Hitler double-dropped MDMA caps that turned out to be cyanide in the Führer bunker, US soldiers advanced on Dachau. Many units were involved, and due to the size of the facility and the number of subcamps, it's unclear which unit was the first liberator. 
As the highest ranked officer present, Brigadier General Henning Linden of the 222nd Infantry Regiment accepted the full surrender of the camp from SS Obersturmführer Heinrich Wicker. Fighting in the region wasn't over though, and in some cases, rogue SS units held out in isolated pockets for weeks. In the weeks and months before the US forces arrived, Dachau had been a hive of activity. The SS camp guards knew the end of the war was on the horizon and that the Allies would hold them responsible for their crimes. Papers were burnt and soldiers sometimes deserted during the night, afraid of what might happen to them if they were found near the site of such atrocities. There was an attempt to liquidate the camp, to murder all the prisoners still alive so no one would be left to accuse the perpetrators. But the desperate German supply situation meant there wasn't enough ammunition. Officers refused to waste what few bullets they had on emaciated prisoners while there was still a war to fight. In the end, the SS left a skeleton crew to run the camp while the bulk of the force retreated toward the Alps, where they planned to make their final stand. Private Harold Porter, a medic with the US 116th Evacuation Hospital, was sent to Dachau to support the camp's liberation. In a letter to his family at home, Porter wrote, As we came to the center of the city, we met a train with a wrecked engine, about 50 cars long. Every car was loaded with bodies. There must have been thousands of them, all obviously starved to death. The train in Dachau's town center became known as the Death Train and was often the first real evidence the US soldiers saw of the Holocaust. Inside the camp, it was far worse. Porter describes being taken to the crematorium and seeing a room 20 feet square crammed to the ceiling with more bodies, one big stinking rotten mess. Their faces purple, their eyes popping, and with a hideous grin on each one. They were nothing but bones and skins. He and all his comrades in the US force that occupied Dachau were profoundly affected by what they saw and experienced in the camps. Most soldiers struggled to take it all in, their brains unable to process the magnitude of the suffering laid out before them. Some men broke down while others worked through the experience with grim determination. Some soldiers were so furious that they dealt out their own justice. Elements of the US 45th Infantry Division were outraged when they saw the death train. When four SS officers surrendered to the 45th soon after their arrival, the enraged Lieutenant William Walsh took matters into his own hands. Ordering them into the death train, he drew his pistol and executed the SS officers on the spot. After what they had seen, the rest of his platoon chose not to intercede. These executions didn't calm down. When Walsh entered the camp and saw prisoners' bodies, stacked like cordwood, he went for more revenge. After marching roughly 30 surrendered SS soldiers, camp guards and German doctors into a coal yard, Walsh drew his pistol and ordered his men to open fire. 17 POWs were cut down before a superior officer interceded. It's estimated that between 50 and 125 German POWs were executed by US forces bent on revenge. We'll likely never know for sure as some soldiers gave weapons to prisoners and gave their permission for them to kill whomever they liked. Some medics also refused to treat wounded SS soldiers or camp guards, deliberately letting them die from wounds sometimes inflicted by the liberators themselves. When General Patton became military governor of Bavaria later in 1945, he blocked all investigations into war crimes by US forces around Dachau. Those who executed German POWs out of revenge were never held accountable. Just like at Dachau, the SS and camp guards at Auschwitz tried to get rid of as much evidence as possible before the Allies arrived. Documents were burned en masse and the prisoners who were still fit enough to work were force marched deeper into German territory. The Soviet 322nd Rifle Division arrived at Auschwitz on January 27, 1945. SS holdouts were still active in the area surrounding the immense camp complex, and over 200 Soviet soldiers died during the advance toward the camp. When they saw the Red Army arrive, the roughly 7,000 prisoners abandoned in the camp wept with joy. The Soviets had no idea what they had just found, and the first question they asked the desperate prisoners was, what are you doing here? It wasn't long before the advancing Soviets uncovered the true scale of the Nazi crimes at Auschwitz. Even the most battle-hardened men, veterans of Stalingrad who had seen the atrocities of Einsatzgruppen in their own country, were in complete shock. 
Colonel Vasily Petrenko, commander of the 107th Infantry Division, arrived with his men to assist the camp's liberation. He later said, I, who saw people dying every day, was shocked by the Nazis' indescribable hatred toward the inmates, who had turned into living skeletons. I read about the Nazis' treatment of Jews in various leaflets, but there was nothing about the Nazis' treatment of women, children, and old men. No records detailing Soviet soldiers taking revenge on camp guards exist, but that doesn't mean it never happened. War crimes were committed by the advancing Soviets in German territory in retribution for German war crimes committed in the Soviet Union. These were often hushed up by the NKVD or dealt with quietly by the Soviet leadership. Even when it had been liberated, Auschwitz remained a prison. Designated a transit camp by the Soviets, Auschwitz was kept in working order to house thousands of Wehrmacht POWs as well as Polish civilians who had signed the Volksliste, a document declaring German ethnicity. Due to a centralized labor source, Auschwitz had been a center for manufacturing military equipment. Once designated a transit camp, the new prisoners were used as forced labor to dismantle this heavy machinery so it could be sent to the Soviet Union. Some Germans and Poles were still laboring in Auschwitz months after the war ended, without the threat of execution, but in similar conditions to those of the persecuted minorities who were initially interred there. Deserters, serial murderers, and the clinically insane. Not people who make good soldiers. But for the manpower-strapped nations of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, any man or woman who could hold a weapon was required to do their duty. In this video, we delve into the dark depths of the Nazi and Soviet penal legions of the Second World War. A warning though, this is going to get pretty grim. For a quick overview, penal legions were units composed of soldiers as well as officers who had been convicted of military crimes. The crimes were varied, from something as simple as making a defeatist comment to murdering an officer, a capital offense. The Nazis and Soviets most commonly deployed penal legions behind the lines, although they were sometimes thrown into combat. The Eastern Front saw the heaviest use of penal legions, but German penal units were active on the Western Front too. The officers commanding penal units all followed the same code that even a soldier convicted of the worst crimes could be redeemed through bloodshed. Discipline was enforced with an iron resolve, and often the soldiers of a penal unit could be summarily executed by their officers for any infraction. Penal unit officers were some of the toughest and most dedicated leaders in the entire Wehrmacht and Red Army. The first German penal unit was the Sonderabteilungen. These were special units set up by Hitler personally in 1935. Any conscripts who didn't seem committed enough to the Nazi ideals could be sent to the unit. The officers were tough disciplinarians, but didn't strive to make the conscripts' lives miserable. Instead, their goal was to instill a sense of Nazi pride and honor in their men. Between 3,000 and 6,000 conscripts passed through the unit and came out as Nazis. The 320 who wouldn't accept indoctrination were quietly transferred to Sachsenhausen concentration camp, never to be heard from again. As the Second World War got into full swing, Sonderabteilungen was replaced with the Bewerbungsbataillon 500. This unit was created as a probationary battalion in which convicted soldiers could earn their way back into their old units through acts of extreme bravery. Convicted soldiers lost their rights as German citizens and were only able to regain them through service in the Bewerbungs Battalion 500. As heroism was the only path to redemption for these condemned men, their combat morale was extremely high. As the war dragged on and the military situation in the East deteriorated for the Wehrmacht, recruits for the Bewerbungs Battalion 500 were pulled from ordinary civilian prisons. Even those sentenced to death could serve in the penal unit and, through a heroic act, have their life spared. In classic Soviet fashion, Stalin watched what the Wehrmacht was doing and decided to copy it, while also cranking up the brutality to 11. It was July 1942 and the Soviets had suffered massive losses during the first year of Operation Barbarossa. Stalin was furious with his men, issuing the infamous Order 227, 
popularized as not one step back. This gave Soviet officers permission to summarily execute any soldier who retreated without permission. Stalin also noted the Wehrmacht's use of penal legions and decided the Red Army needed some too. Life in a Soviet penal legion was nothing like life in a Wehrmacht one. Instead of being indoctrinated with a sense of duty to the Vaterland, the Soviet penal troops were seen as cowards who had abandoned the motherland in her time of need. This was a most grievous sin and it had to be atoned for in blood. A penal soldier typically left the unit in two ways, by being wounded in combat, severely enough to be incapacitated and carried off the battlefield, or by actions so heroic that a medal should be awarded. Soldiers could leave a penal unit at the end of their sentence, which was often three months or less, but this was rare. For example, 3,348 soldiers passed through the first independent penal company of the 57th Army between August 1942 and September 1945. Out of these, 25% were killed or went missing, 58% were wounded, 14% were pardoned for outstanding conduct, and 3% were released after serving their sentences. Officers were often convicted of cowardice because they ordered a retreat. Their troops were often let off the hook for this offence as they were simply following orders as usual. The officers that ordered these retreats, however, were stripped of their ranks and thrown into a penal battalion, whilst ordinary soldiers convicted of cowardice were placed in penal companies. You'd be forgiven for thinking the penal units as disposable, thrown into the front line only to be killed immediately, but this was far from the case. The penal battalions were elite shock troops. Red Army officers were generally experienced and knew how to work together with other units. Having lost rank, pay, and privileges, they had the most to gain from being reinstated to their original units. When you put hundreds of men desperate to redeem themselves together, you get an elite stormtrooper force. If the only path to redemption is an order of Lenin or a stretcher, you fight harder than anyone else. That said, attrition rates were higher in Soviet penal units than for all other Soviet infantry units. They were the worst in the penal companies, units designed only for convicted soldiers, not officers. Discipline in these units was far harsher than in the battalions due to their lower combat morale. Without decent pay and privileges, these soldiers had far less to fight for, most of them just trying to stay alive. These soldiers lived on a knife's edge between life and death every single day. The following are three examples of a normal day for a soldier of a penal company. The 123rd Independent Penal Company Ordered to assault a bridge with their full unit strength of 670 soldiers. They failed to take the bridge, having only 47 men left alive at the end of the day. The 61st Independent Penal Company. Four days after they failed to attack a German position, three soldiers were picked out while on parade. They were shot in front of the whole company to motivate the rest. The 128th Independent Penal Company. Lost nearly its entire strength, 54 killed and 193 wounded, in six days during February 1944. It also changed commanders five times between January 1st and April 10th of that year, the commanders lasting 11 to 35 days before being severely wounded or killed. While the Soviet penal battalions were ruthless, they weren't pure evil. No, that title accurately describes a penal unit under SS command almost putting Japan's Unit 731 to shame in terms of barbarity, we're referring to the Dielavanga Brigade. It's difficult to describe just how evil the Dielavanga Brigade was. Its commander, the convicted child rapist Oskar Dielavanga, recruited the most sadistic prisoners and Wehrmacht rejects he could find in German territory. These included convicted arsonists, murderers, rapists, and the clinically insane. The brigade was usually assigned to guard duties or anti-partisan activities behind front lines. They were first sent to Poland, where they slaughtered, raped, and looted their way across the countryside. After a complaint by a high-ranking SS official, they were moved to Belarusia, 
Dilavanga continued his terror campaign against the locals. His favorite method, you ask? Forcing civilians into a barn before setting it on fire, then machine gunning those who tried to run. He was also fond of personally executing the locals with his pistol. Occasionally, the brigade was ordered to the front lines. All their murdering experience hadn't made Delavanga's men good soldiers. In every engagement, they took extremely heavy casualties and were labelled as inept by regular German soldiers. This ineptitude cost the Delavanga brigade dearly, and if not for a constant supply of sadistic murderers, the unit would have been wiped out several times. This brings us to the darkest fact about the penal legions of the Second World War, that they often committed the most atrocious war crimes imaginable and were seldom held accountable. As both Soviet and German penal units were made up of convicted criminals, they were expected to commit war crimes such as slaughtering civilians, mass rape and executing POWs. When these crimes were committed, they were rarely reported to high command. Punishments usually weren't harsh and the blame was often placed with officers for failing to supervise their troops. Soviet units were never held accountable for the war crimes they committed. In their six-year rampage, the Dielavanga Brigade killed upwards of 30,000 civilians. The unit acted with such barbarity that even the SS launched an investigation, which was blocked by Gottlob Berger, an SS chief and close personal friend of Dielavanga. The brigade was thankfully mostly destroyed during the retreat back to Germany, but some of its men survived, in hiding and as POWs. Very few were held accountable for their war crimes. Dielewanger himself was killed in June 1945 while detained in Althausen Detention Center, a POW camp run by French and Polish soldiers in Germany. It's unclear whether he was killed by French, French colonial or Polish guards, but it's likely he was identified by a Polish communist network who ordered the guards to torture him to death. I reckon he got what was coming to him. Bombs blew houses to rubble. People cooked alive. Monsters did unspeakable things to innocent women and children. Hundreds of cities and their people suffered terribly in the Second World War, though some far more than others. In this video, we're going to give you an overview of eight cities which we think were the most dangerous, terrifying cities you could have lived in during the Second World War. The Philippines had it rough in World War II, and this was especially true for its capital city, Manila. Just 10 hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese invasion of the Philippine Islands began. Allied forces defending the Philippine Islands were forced to flee, leaving them to suffer a three-year Japanese occupation, in which time Japanese soldiers committed innumerable atrocities. It wasn't until the Allies returned, under the command of General MacArthur, however, that the Japanese took their atrocities to unprecedented levels. During the 1945 Battle of Manila, Thousands of Filipino and American troops perished, yes, but in just the month for which that battle raged, the Japanese murdered some 100,000 civilians in the most brutal of ways. Women and children were shot, bayoneted, decapitated and set on fire. Some were used as human shields and then murdered. Others survived only to live the rest of their lives with horrible mutilations. Women and young girls were herded into designated buildings in which the Japanese raped them in groups and then killed them. The city itself saw some of the fiercest urban combat in all the war and in all of history and it was utterly laid to waste by Japanese and American shells. While it's largely agreed that the Germans started the Second World War, the devastation wrought upon some German cities was criminal. The city of Hamburg, vital to German industry, was repeatedly hit by Allied bombers throughout the war, but they dealt a truly crippling blow to the city in July 1943, during an operation codenamed Gomorrah. Flying side by side, British Royal Air Force and United States Army Air Forces rained hellfire on Hamburg inciting a firestorm which melted as many as 58,000 civilians to the bone and wounded a further 180,000. The flames were so intense that they birthed a 460 meter high fire tornado which tore through the city at a temperature of 815 degrees Celsius. The 40,000 odd firemen in the area didn't stand a chance and when the fires finally went out, 
some 200 major factories and 4,000 lesser factories had been destroyed, truly decimating the city's industrial output. And the Allies weren't finished yet. They bombed Hamburg a further 69 times before the end of the war. We can't mention firestorms without hitting the German riverside city of Dresden, whose story was a little different from Hamburg's. While Hamburg was an industrial powerhouse, Dresden was a city of culture, known throughout the war for its arts and beautiful Gothic architecture. The Allies arranged the city's ruin primarily to crush German morale, and in this they succeeded, but at what cost? The answer is some 25,000 civilians, of whom a great many were roasted alive in their homes and bomb shelters as an Allied firestorm roared through Dresden in February 1945. Some 78,000 residential dwellings were burnt to the ground while a further 27,700 were left uninhabitable and 64,500 were otherwise damaged. To hit the message home, more than 90% of Dresden's city center was obliterated. All of this is especially terrible because the people of Dresden believed the Allies would never target the city, for it simply wasn't a militarily viable target. This turned out to be a fatal miscalculation. Like Hamburg, Germany's capital city Berlin was bombed by the Allies all throughout World War II, with the British alone dropping more than 45,500 tons of explosives on it. All in all, 16 square kilometers of the city was pulverized and about a third of all its houses were rendered uninhabitable. By May 1945, about 40% of Berlin's population had fled in fear of their lives. That's 1.7 million people. When the Red Army finally brought the fight back to Berlin and ended the war in Europe, they unleashed some 40,000 tons of explosives on the German capital in just two weeks. What happened when the Red Army split into the city was about as atrocious as what the Japanese did in Manila. The Soviets slew some 125,000 civilians in Berlin, supposedly taking revenge on the Germans who had done the same to their women and children. In reality, it was German women and children, not German soldiers, whom the Soviets raped and murdered. And they truly tainted the great victory they worked so hard to achieve. Poland's capital, Warsaw, took the full brunt of Germany from the beginning of World War II to the end of the war in Europe. The city itself was quite literally demolished, with 85% to 90% of it turned to dust by the end of the war. It started with the bombing of Warsaw in the 1939 invasion of Poland and ended, mostly, with Germany's systematic demolition of the city toward the end of 1944, which was set in motion to create more German living space and also in retaliation to the Polish resistance's Warsaw Uprising. Between 1939 and the end of the war in Europe, Warsaw was also home to the largest Nazi ghetto of World War II, in which hundreds of thousands of Jews were imprisoned, some 460,000 at its peak. These poor human beings virtually slept on top of each other, and as many as 92,000 Jews perished inside the ghetto as a result of starvation, disease, the Warsaw Uprising, and the city's systematic demolition. Some 300,000 residents of the Warsaw Ghetto were sent to concentration camps, where they all became victims of the Holocaust. To put this into perspective, only 6% of Warsaw's population was left in the city at the war's end. That's right, 6%. When you think of ruined Japanese cities, you likely think of the two cities hit with the nuclear warheads in the final days of the Second World War. The Japanese capital city of Tokyo, however, was firebombed by the B-29s of the United States Army Air Forces all throughout 1944 and 1945, and also subjected to the single most destructive aerial raid of all time, Operation Meeting House. All in all, the Americans razed 41 square kilometers of central Tokyo to the ground, ended the lives of up to 130,000 civilians, and left 1 million people without homes. More than 267,000 buildings were destroyed and the city's industrial output was slashed in half. In Operation Meeting House, conducted on the 9th and 10th of March 1945, the USAAF flew over Tokyo with 269 B-29s and murdered up to 100,000 Japanese civilians, accounting for more than 76% of the civilians killed across all the strategic bombings of Tokyo. Up to 1 million more were wounded and some consider the operation, like the firebombing of Dresden and the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to have been a war crime. Of course, we now have Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 
two Japanese cities which maintain the title of being the only cities on Earth to have tasted the wrath of an atomic bomb. For this reason, we've clumped them together. Before the August 1945 bombings, in which the USAAF deployed the nuclear warheads Little Boy and Fat Man, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were thriving, but on the 6th and 9th of that month, they were reduced to radioactive dust bowls. Up to 126,000 civilians were killed in the first atomic blast, and up to 80,000 were killed in the second, for a total of 226,000 deaths. While the blasts instantaneously turned many people to ash, it was the after effects which would have made living in Hiroshima and Nagasaki so terrifying. Many survived but were horribly burnt, and many suffered from radiation related sicknesses, which, assuming they didn't die a slow, agonizing death before they could procreate, could be passed down through the generations. The fires birthed by the first bomb spread 13 square kilometers and destroyed 63% of Hiroshima's buildings. In contrast, just under 23% of Nagasaki's buildings were destroyed. The German siege of Leningrad, lasting two years and four months between September 1941 and January 1944, remains the longest and most devastating siege in human history, and as such, Leningrad wins as our most dangerous terrifying city to live in during the Second World War. It is estimated that up to 1 million Soviet civilians perished during the siege or while trying to flee it. In total, 1.4 million were successfully evacuated. On top of living each day in fear of being torn apart by German shells, the people of Leningrad suffered from extreme starvation and got it so bad that thousands resorted to cannibalism. There were so many corpses that there was no choice but to leave them in piles in the street, piles which froze solid in the biting Russian winter. The city itself wasn't quite as devastated as some of the others we've mentioned so far, with just 16% of its houses being destroyed by German bombs and guns, though the Germans also severed all public utilities, like water and electricity, making the city of Leningrad truly inhospitable. When humans get together in large numbers, bad things can happen. War is all fear and hate, and World War II remains the worst war we've ever seen. I don't think any belligerent state was without its atrocities and war crimes. Even the kindest of us can devolve into monsters, but it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise to you that the Soviet Union was right up there with Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. In this video, we're going to outline the atrocities of the USSR and its blood red army in the Second World War. The Soviet Union engulfed a whole lot of land before, during and after the Second World War. It's free real estate. And one of its favorite things to do with the people living in that land was to boot them out of it. The Soviets deported hundreds of thousands of people from their homes and countries in those war-torn years, and many of those unfortunate souls were thrown deep into the USSR, as far as Siberia, which was basically a death sentence. Between 1939 and 1941, for instance, some 1.5 million people were deported out of Poland by the Soviets. This particular deportation was on a massive scale, but it happened elsewhere too. In Estonia, for instance, almost 11,000 people were deported by the Soviets in just three days, mostly in train cars designed for moving cattle. The Soviets deported people from their own territory too, such as farmers who owned anything over eight acres of land whom they considered to be a threat to Bolshevism, well-off Greek minorities, of which some 50,000 were booted out, and persons of Finnish descent living in the part of the USSR known back then as Ingria of which some 76% had received the boot as early as 1939. On this latter example, after the end of the continuation war, the Soviet Union was supposed to send the Ingrian Finns back to Ingria, but instead they forced them to settle in Siberia and Central Russia and Asia. While many deportees were simply ejected from their homes and countries, others were thrown into prisons, forced to carry out manual labor or forced into military service. Prisoners, especially political prisoners, all through the Soviet Union and its occupation zones were tortured to death for intelligence purposes and sometimes just for entertainment. We'll get into military prisoners of war soon, but for now, we're mostly talking about civilian prisoners, of whom many were women and children. From Poland, for example, 
The Soviet NKVD took hundreds of thousands of political prisoners to camps in the USSR, where they cut off their fingers, ears, and noses, scalded them with boiling water, bound them together with barbed wire, and shot them to death or simply left them to die of starvation and exposure, among other things. Others were delivered to gulags, which were Soviet forced labor camps. Gulags were torture in themselves and few deported to them ever made it back home. In the years immediately after the war, hundreds of thousands of German civilians were deported to the gulags in the Soviet Union, where it's estimated that more than 200,000 of them perished due to starvation and disease. Instead of being imprisoned or worked to death, others still were forced to spill their blood in the Red Army throughout the war. In 1941, around 34,000 Estonians were added to the ranks of the Red Army, and only about 30% of them actually survived the war. Between 1940 and 1941, some 150,000 Poles were sent to war under Soviet flags against Finland and Germany. These are just a few of many examples. For other European civilians, death came more swiftly. Sometimes, the NKVD and their Red Army muscle found it easier to execute political prisoners on the spot, while other civilians became casualties of Soviet scorched earth policies. In Kautla, Estonia, on the 24th of July 1941, for instance, Soviet destruction battalions set civilian farms and farmhouses on fire with their occupants still inside and tortured other civilians to death, reducing the village's population by 30 in just one day. On the 26th of January 1945, in the Polish village of Prashevichy, the Red Army massacred some 70 civilians, including women, children, and infants some simply for trying to put out their burning homes. In Nemersdorf, East Prussia, on the 21st of October 1944, the Red Army massacred 74 German civilians and some 50 French and Belgian POWs, though not before torturing them for their own entertainment. According to a Wehrmacht officer who later discovered the scene, the Soviets had nailed some civilians to barn doors in cruciform positions. Again, these are just a few of many, many examples. Generally, Soviet destruction battalions plundered, murdered, and razed civilian settlements to the ground, just as high up command had ordered them to do. This brings us to our next and most vulgar point. The Red Army raped hundreds of thousands of women and young girls before, during, and after the Second World War. In Poland alone, it's estimated that more than 100,000 females were raped by Red Army soldiers, leading to a countrywide STD pandemic which affected about 10% of the population after the war. In Hungary, rape victim estimates vary from 5,000 to 200,000. Of course, this occurred all throughout Germany too and especially around the Battle of Berlin. The number of German women raped by the Soviet soldiers has been estimated to be as high as 2 million, and it's also estimated that some 240,000 of these victims were killed in the act or after it. In the words of British military historian Anthony Beevor, it was the greatest phenomenon of mass rape in history, and no women from 8 to 80 years old were spared. Similar atrocities occurred after the war in Europe during the Soviet invasion of Manchuria, in which the Red Army soldiers raped and massacred thousands of Japanese women and children. As one witness reported it, the soldiers were permitted by their commanders to carry out, in his words, three days of rape and pillage on a newly captured city. So far, we've mostly covered the atrocities inflicted by the Red Army soldiers on civilians. But what about military personnel? All in all, the Soviets tortured and murdered hundreds of thousands of enemy soldiers, many after they had been taken as POWs, and many almost immediately after they had surrendered. It's estimated that as many as 3 million German soldiers, for instance, were captured by the Soviets throughout the war, with more than 380,000 of them perishing in captivity. Others reported the German death toll as high as 1 million, which is more than 33% of all German soldiers that were captured. Many of these POWs succumbed to starvation, disease, exposure, previously inflicted wounds, and Red Army violence. The Soviets carried out soldier massacres too, with the Katyn massacre being among the most infamous. Between April and May 1940, the NKVD executed some 22,000 Polish military personnel, purported spies and saboteurs, land and factory owners, and other, in quotation marks, undesirables, in Katyn Forest in Russia and Kalinin and Kharkiv prisons in Russia and the Ukraine. 
What makes this massacre so scandalous is that the USSR first blamed it on the Nazis and then, in 1990, admitted to it. As it turned out, unsurprisingly, Stalin himself had approved of the massacre. While not quite on the same scale as Katyn, between the 29th of December 1941 and New Year's Day of 1942, the Red Army executed up to 160 German soldiers in the Crimean port city of Feodosia. Here, the Soviets mutilated the helpless soldiers, threw them out of windows, and soaked them in cold water so they would slowly freeze to death. Across several Ukrainian towns in February 1943, the Red Army took 596 Axis personnel prisoner, of which 508 were military and 88 were civilian. Not just Germans, but Italians, Romanians, Hungarians, and fellow Ukrainians too. Just like in Feodosia, the Soviets mutilated them horrifically, cutting pieces off their body and stuffing them into their mouths before killing them. Pretty atrocious and grim, right? But what we mustn't forget is that the Soviets weren't the only ones who did stuff like this, and this video of course doesn't detail what the soldiers of other nations, namely Germany, did to the soldiers and civilians of the USSR. Not to say that revenge is an excuse. It isn't. War is hell. But what happens to captured soldiers after a battle is sometimes much worse. When they weren't shot immediately as part of take no prisoners policies, the POWs of World War II could be sent to some of the worst places imaginable. In this video, we're going to discuss the absolute worst camps and prisons an unlucky POW could end up in, saving the most horrific for last. Located in what is now picturesque Polish farmland, the Nazi POW camp Stalag 8F, sometimes called Stalag 344, was designated for Polish and Russian POWs. These were two ethnic groups the Nazis considered to be subhuman, and Slavic peoples, in general, were seen as fit only for slave labor by the Nazis. Their treatment as POWs in Stalag 8F reflects this. The POWs waged a constant war of attrition against starvation. This was their biggest killer as desperately malnourished soldiers were highly prone to disease. The unsanitary and cramped conditions provided a breeding ground for many diseases, the worst being typhus and dysentery. In these conditions, death was everywhere. Of the roughly 200,000 Soviet and Polish POWs who passed through the camp during the war, around 42,000 died. In other words, for every five POWs who set foot in the camp, at least one would die. In 1945, when the USSR was taking more ground by the day, the POWs from Stalag 8F began what was later called the Death March. The POWs were forced to walk across Germany, sometimes without shoes and nearly always without food, to escape the tsunami of advancing Soviet troops. Hundreds more died on the Death March, some simply dropping dead where they stood from exhaustion and others freezing to death in their sleep. While less brutal than other camps in this video, the sheer number of deaths at Stalag 8F makes it one of the worst POW camps of the Second World War. Now, we're all aware of Japanese cruelty in World War II, especially toward their prisoners, though one camp was worse than all others. While holding fewer POWs than many other camps, the POW camp Sandakan on the northern edge of Borneo was the site of one of the worst atrocities of the war. In August 1943, between 2000 and 2500 British and Australian POWs were detained in Sandakan POW camp and forced to do manual labour. Their job was to turn an impenetrable jungle into an operational military airfield. Conditions were deplorable. Water for the POWs was filthy and often made them sick, the food ration was only a handful of dirty rice per day, beatings occurred regularly and men died daily but things only got worse. By mid-1944, the war in the Pacific had turned in the favor of the Allies, and the Japanese were worried about losing access to Borneo's vital oil fields, deploying hundreds of additional troops to reinforce these positions. For the POWs of Sandakan, this was a nightmare, as their meager food ration virtually disappeared to feed the incoming soldiers. The Allies successfully bombed the airstrip, rendering it unusable, several months later in January 1945. To prevent them escaping into the arms of the Allies, who were expected to land any day, the Japanese marched the camp's British and Aussie POWs to an inland base in waves leaving roughly every month. Those who were too sick to walk were left at Sandakan to starve, 
Along the march, POWs were continuously shot for falling behind. By the time the marches had finished, only 38 POWs of the original 2,500 were still alive. Too weak to work, they were all executed. Sundakan was a death sentence for a POW, and the Australian government still regards it as the worst atrocity ever carried out on Australian soldiers in war. Another Nazi death camp, Stalag 6K or Stalag 326, was similar to the first Stalag of this video, except it managed to be even worse. Housing mostly Poles and Russians, but also Italians and French POWs, Stalag 326 was another camp in the broad network of facilities designed to exterminate so-called subhumans through exhaustive work. Camps like Stalag 326 used slave labor to produce many goods critical for the war effort, like weapons and engine parts. This practice was encouraged by German Reich officials, who naturally took a cut of the sizable profits. The POWs of Stalag 326 were also rented out for farm work in the surrounding area, making fat bank for their captors. Mass conscription of men for the military had caused manpower shortages in the Reich, a shortage that POW slave labor was supposed to remedy. Stalag 326 was liberated in 1945 by an American armored unit. They were shocked with the conditions they found, describing a foul, death-like odor around the camp Russian POWs who were completely demoralized. Out of the roughly 200,000 POWs, primarily Russian, who had passed through the camp, 65,000 perished there. There was nearly nowhere worse to be in World War II than on board a Japanese hellship. Mostly smaller freighters that had been hastily converted for human cargo, the Imperial Japanese Navy shipped tens of thousands of captured Allied POWs and Southeast Asian civilians to Japan, China, and other parts of their empire. These POWs were destined to spend the rest of the war as slave laborers and, sometimes, test subjects for demented medical experiments. Life on board an aptly named Hellship was unimaginable. Herded into tiny cargo spaces below deck, POWs were crammed so tightly and with so little ventilation that some died from lack of oxygen. Other common causes of death were dehydration, starvation, and the ever-present disease. Dysentery was extremely common and men were forced to relieve themselves wherever they could, the deck quickly running slick with infectious excrement. The conditions were so hellish, it wasn't uncommon for POWs to go insane. An environment of oppressive humidity, little oxygen and no water or food broke many men's minds. Desperate and deranged, some POWs would drink urine or slit their veins to open and drink their own blood, and sometimes the blood of others. To round off an experience which the word hellish doesn't do justice, many of these POWs never reached their destinations. The Japanese Navy refused to mark POW transport ships in accordance with the maritime law, meaning that many were torpedoed by Allied submarines and aircraft hunting for Japanese troop ships. One hell ship, the Suez Maru, carried 548 sick POWs from slave labor camps in Malaysia. She began to sink after being torpedoed by an American submarine. Most of the human cargo drowned in the hold, but 250 POWs managed to escape. They swam to another Japanese ship, which, after picking up survivors from the Japanese crew, machine gunned the water, murdering all 250 POWs. Believe it or not, there was a fate worse than even a Japanese hell ship. The only entry for the Allies in this video, we have the Soviet Gulags. Whether they were toiling and starving in the jungles of South Asia or the weapons factories of the German Reich, Allied POWs only had to endure captivity for a maximum of five years. Axis POWs thrown into the black hole of the Soviet Gulags weren't so lucky. Their war may have been over, but their suffering would go on for 11 more years. To rebuild its occupied territories after the war, the USSR needed a resilient and expendable workforce, which they found in the millions of Axis POWs they had captured during the war. Over 10,000 unlucky POWs, who were mostly Germans and Poles, remained in the hellish gulags until 1953. Another 9,200 had to toil in the gulags until 1956, before being returned home. One of the worst of these gulags was Forkuta. 
Located in Arctic Siberia, the inmates of Forkuta Gulag mined for coal. This horrendous work forced POWs and other prisoners deep underground without proper equipment. Starving, weakened and working in the near total darkness and choking dust of a coal mine meant accidents were frequent. Inadequate food and medicine meant that disease was also rife and when it compounded with the blistering cold of an arctic winter, the death rate soared. The end of Stalin's reign of terror in 1953 saw records of the numbers of POWs and deaths in the gulags mysteriously disappear. Likely burned by Soviet officers looking to hide their crimes from the new regime, many of the Fort Kuta camp records also conveniently vanished. We don't know for sure how many POWs were murdered in each camp, but we do know that at least 1.1 million Axis POWs went into Soviet captivity and never returned. From being executed in the jungles of Borneo to working 11 years after the war in a Soviet gulag, we've covered just 5 of the most hellish places an unlucky POW could be sent during the war. Though, do you agree with our assessment? Which one of these places do you think is the worst? Can you think of any others? I believe the Polish are among the strongest people to ever live. They are a people tempered by the fires of war and a true testament to human resilience. In the inferno of World War II, Poland endured not only surviving occupation by two ruthless juggernauts, but making crucial contributions to the Allied victory and holding on to what it means to be Polish despite unspeakable risk. To understand just how tough the Polish were throughout the war, it helps to understand just what caliber of atrocities they endured. To empathize with the poor souls subjected to such atrocities, it helps to see through their eyes. So after summarizing Polish suffering, resilience and resistance throughout World War II, we will behold it through the stories of two brave Polish partisans. What happened in Poland after both the Nazis and Soviets invaded in September 1939 makes all depictions of hell look like a summertime theme park. And it's not as if the atrocities inflicted on the Poles were inflicted solely by the Nazis. The Soviets were almost equally as diabolical, sharing in the Nazi opinion that Poland should be obliterated politically, economic, socially, culturally, and to a certain extent, physically. Both Hitler and Stalin wished for Poland to no longer exist, for it to be eradicated from history, and for the persisting space to be a part of the Reich and the USSR. Though, of course, Hitler never intended to let Stalin keep his share, nor for a square centimeter of the land designated future Lebensraum to become part of the USSR. Nevertheless, before Hitler stabbed Stalin in the face and invaded the Soviet Union, the two of them assailed Poland night and day, trying to turn their evil wish into reality. In Soviet annexed Poland, the Soviets enforced communist ideology by burning books, seizing control of schools and universities, ripping down all Polish monuments, banning the word Poland, generally spreading pro-Soviet propaganda, and much more. If they thought anyone was or could be a threat to their rule, they arrested them and then deported them to the gulags, often in Siberia. Other undesirables they just executed, like in the infamous Katyn massacre in which the Soviets executed around 22,000 Poles, military and civilian. They weren't above massacring the patients and staff of hospitals either, nor torturing people. The NKVD was almost synonymous with the Nazi Gestapo and was the cold iron tool with which the Soviets tried to prize Poland apart. The Nazis made the Poles suffer in every way the Soviets did, and more. On top of enforcing Nazi ideology, arresting, deporting, enslaving, and massacring undesirables, of which many were women and children, murdering hospital patients and staff, and torturing people in some instances just to trial methods of torture, Poland's German occupiers also subjected Polish Jews to the Holocaust right there in their own country. If anyone was caught assisting the Jews, the Nazis would kill them and their entire family. They also took Polish civilian hostages, and if a German soldier was killed, they would murder up to 100 hostages in retaliation. No quote-unquote undesirables were safe. The Nazis raped women and then either forced them into brothels or just murdered them in mass. As well as trialing methods of torture on Polish prisoners, the Nazis subjected them to medical experiments, basically using human beings as guinea pigs. If all that wasn't enough, the Germans responded to the 1944 uprising in Warsaw by pulverizing the city, 
Throughout both Nazi and Soviet occupation, the Poles suffered from lack of supplies and food. They either sourced supplies through the black market or succumbed to starvation, sickness or cold. Overall, Poland was of course an absolute war zone, trampled by the Germans and Soviets as Hitler and Stalin played tug of war with the Eastern Front. And it's estimated that between 16 and 22% of its population perished in the Second World War. That's almost one in five. Now, looking at Polish suffering in isolation is a massive injustice to the strength and resilience of the Poles. They not only challenged the September 1939 invasions like cornered lions, but also resisted enemy occupation and fought alongside the Allies in other countries and on other fronts. After the invasion of Poland, a Polish government in exile was formed in France, and after the fall of France, its HQ was relocated to Britain. The Polish government in exile oversaw the Polish underground state and many of the Polish military forces contributing to the Allied effort. In the midst of war, however, it's never so simple. Some Polish resistance and military forces opposed the Polish government in exile, aligning themselves with communism and the Soviet Union, and some even fought in the Wehrmacht by their own will or the Nazis. The Polish underground state was the collective title of all the Polish resistance organizations aligned with the Polish government in exile, and it was one of the largest resistance organizations the world has ever seen. It not only sabotaged Poland's Nazi and Soviet occupiers, delivered vital intelligence to the Allies, and rescued many Jews from the Holocaust, but also contested Nazi and Soviet plans to obliterate Polish society and culture. To do so, the underground state chopped Nazi and Soviet ideology at the root, educating young partisans in underground schools and sustaining society and culture through underground radio, print, music and theatre. On fighting forces, the Armia Krajowa, the home army, was the underground state's largest, numbering around 400,000 in its prime. There were a number of smaller resistance groups allied with the Home Army, such as the Peasants' Battalion, though there were also resistance groups which refused to join the Home Army, such as the ultra-nationalist group, the National Armed Forces, as well as underground groups who strive for communism with the Soviets, such as Armia Ludova, the People's Army. The relationship between all of these resistance groups was complicated to say the least, and they sometimes got into violent confrontations. Before we move on to the Polish military in the West and East, it's important to note that, despite the threat of death to oneself and one's family, Poland was the only German-occupied country to set up an organization to help Jews in the Holocaust, and overall, the underground state saved more Jews than any of the Western allies in World War II. After the invasion of Poland, the Polish government in exile mustered over 80,000 men in France to defend against the Germans. By the time France had fallen, many of these Poles had become casualties and the remainder, some 19,000, were evacuated to Britain. These became the Polish First Corps. Originally constituting the bulk of the Polish armed forces in the east, a 75,000 strong Polish army called Anders Army joined the west under British command, becoming the Polish Second Corps. By the end of the war, Polish armed forces in the West numbered around 195,000, and throughout it, the Poles fought with skill and ferocity on land, sea and sky, claiming vengeance on the Nazis in the Atlantic, the North Africa Campaign, the Italian Campaign, the Battle of Britain, and in many other operations on the Western Front, including the Allied invasion of Germany. Especially consequential were the Polish contributions to the Battle of Britain and the Battle of Monte Cassino. Sir Hugh C.T. Dowding described the Polish Air Force in the Battle of Britain. All three squadrons swung in the fight with a dash of enthusiasm which is beyond praise. They were inspired by a burning hatred for the Germans which made them very deadly opponents. In the Battle of Monte Cassino, General Anders oxygenated his men's burning hatred for the Germans saying, Go and take revenge for all the suffering in our land, for what you have suffered for many years in Russia and for years of separation from your families. After Hitler stabbed Stalin in the face with Operation Barbarossa, Stalin made an agreement with the Polish government in exile to recruit an army from the Poles deported to and held captive in the Soviet Union at the start of the war. This was Anders' army, which after serving in the Soviet Union, was later transferred to the West and into British command. After Anders' army left, however, there were still thousands of Poles in the Soviet Union, 
Stalin molded them into the Polish People's Army, a communist-led formation of some 200,000 strong, which was squashed into the first Belarusian and first Ukrainian fronts. Overall, the Polish armed forces in the east bled all along the eastern front and the Polish People's Army, later bolstered by Armia Ludowa, became the military in communist ruled Poland after the war. Now that we've briefly summarized Polish suffering, resilience and resistance throughout the Second World War, let's try and imagine all that from the perspectives of two Polish partisans. Jan Roman Bitna was born in Kolbuszowa, Poland in 1921 and joined a resistance group a month after the Germans invaded his country. This group, the Polish People's Independent Action, was infiltrated and disbanded just a few months later, though that wasn't enough to frighten Bitna. He returned from Warsaw to where he was born and joined the anti-Nazi resistance group called the Union of Armed Struggle, later renamed the Home Army. In March 1941, Bitnar joined the Grey Ranks, an organization dedicated to scouting and sabotage. Serving the Grey Ranks, he removed a Nazi flag from an art gallery and graffitied the symbol of the Polish underground state on a monument, among other minor sabotage operations that were punishable by death. Two years in, he was captured, held, and tortured by the Gestapo in Paviak prison. In his three days there, Bitna endured such excruciating, crippling torture that he died four days after being rescued. This brave Pole's story is remarkable because he joined a new resistance organization right after his former organization was torn apart by the Gestapo, and he likely saw many of his friends tortured and killed by the Gestapo as a result. He knew the risk, but he fought for Poland anyway. Everyone knows Witold Pilecki as the man who volunteered for Auschwitz, and that's exactly what this Polish officer and resistance leader did. After fighting the Germans in the invasion of his country, Pilecki co-founded the secret Polish army and then joined the Home Army. In September 1940, he let himself get captured and he was soon after in Auschwitz, where he was tasked with gathering information and sparking resistance from the inside. Pilecki organized the Union of Military Organizations, ZOW, and ZOW shared outside news with the prisoners, helped distribute supplies throughout the camp, bolstered prisoner morale, and established intelligence networks which provided the Polish underground state and the Western Allies insight into the atrocious conditions in the camp. Pilecki managed to escape in April 1943 and reach Warsaw in August that year, where he gave a comprehensive report to the Home Army. After the war, Pilecki was arrested, tortured and then sentenced to death for espionage and planning the assassinations of members of the Soviet-controlled Ministry of Public Security of Poland, among other charges. He denied the espionage and assassination charges, but pleaded guilty to some lesser charges. Regardless of the caliber of his charges, he was shot in the back of the head in May 1948. After receiving his sentence, Pilecki famously said, I've been trying to live my life so that in the hour of my death, I would rather feel joy than fear. Imagine being so devout to your country that you volunteer for Auschwitz and then imagine your patriotism and bravery being rewarded by death at the hands of dirty communists. World War II may have ended in 1945, though Polish suffering unfortunately did not. The Soviet Union permanently annexed the territory it took in September 1939, expelling most of the Poles living there, and these people went on to inhabit the free city of Danzig and the former German territory east of the rivers Oder and Neisse. Stalin ignored the Polish government in exile and essentially closed his communist fist on all that he hadn't directly annexed. It wasn't until 1989 that what remained of pre-World War II Poland shed communism and became the modern democratic republic of Poland. While our pasts may not define our future, they certainly shape our present. History shapes our world and the history of Poland, particularly as it endured the inferno of World War II and the ashes of its fiery wake, tempered the Poles into some of the strongest, most resilient humans ever to walk on our world. In this context, however, strength and resilience don't just come down to the physical endurance and survival of the Poles, but also the endurance and survival of what the Nazis and Soviets failed to obliterate, Polish identity.
I do think that was largely due to the lion-like courage of the Polish underground state and men and women like Jan Bittner and Wiltod Pilecki who served in it, and also the ferocious and ceaseless toils of the Poles who fought for their home abreast foreign allies. Poland may never soften up after the hell it endured, and I think there's no better way to end this video than saying that Poland never officially capitulated in the Second World War. Warfare often brings out the darkest parts of humanity, but when the bullets stop flying and peace is finally reached, we have a duty to hold the criminals accountable for their actions. However, in the years since the end of the most destructive war in human history, the Japanese government still hasn't taken full responsibility for wartime atrocities. In this video, we dive into the horrific deeds of the Imperial Japanese Empire. But first, a warning. This is going to be a grim one. While the Allies advanced toward Japan in the final days of the Second World War, the Japanese military police were busy burning documents. Not battle plans, nor POW records, no. They were burning records concerning so-called comfort women. This is what they wanted to hide. From 1932 to 1945, between 100,000 and 200,000 women and girls were trafficked across the Japanese Empire to inappropriately named comfort stations. There, they were continually beaten and raped, sometimes as often as 40 times per day by Japanese soldiers and officers. These enslaved women were usually forced to work in the rape stations for just a few months, their bodies too damaged to be of much, in quotation marks, use to the Japanese after that. In the early stages of Japan's campaign to conquer the Asia Pacific, Prostitutes from Japan voluntarily followed the army to staff brothels set up for the officers. Army higher-ups wanted more, but the supply of willing volunteers from Japan quickly evaporated. Their first fix was to start the propaganda machine. Clerical, manufacturing and nursing jobs were advertised with generous salaries and they attracted many young female workers. It was a scam, and these women quickly found themselves forced into sexual slavery. When word of the scam got out, the Japanese started paying local gangs for a steady supply of women instead. These unlucky ones were kidnapped off the street on their way home from work or from outside their schools. Women and girls as young as 11 from China, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaya, Thailand, Burma, New Guinea, Hong Kong, Macau, French Indochina, the Netherlands, and Australia were preyed upon. But the majority were Korean. They were kidnapped by gangsters or soldiers and then broken in by constant rape. The physical trauma they experienced often led to infections, but life-saving medicine was kept for use on soldiers only. The damage inflicted on these women and girls left many infertile. The horror of military-run sexual slavery is too much for many in Japan, to the point where some political factions outright deny it. Some politicians, such as Toru Hashimoto, the former mayor of Osaka, try to justify the atrocity. In his own words, when soldiers are running around at the risk of losing their lives, if you want them to have a rest in such a situation, a comfort woman system is necessary. Anyone can understand that. We don't understand it. Only the most deranged minds could come up with a fate worse than what we've just described, and the Japanese managed to do just that. They were the doctors from hell, who officially worked for the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department of the Kwantung Army. But unofficially, they were known as Unit 731. Based in northern China, Unit 731 experimented on POWs and civilians that kidnapped. The sadistic war criminals pretending to be doctors were interested in how the human body was affected by diseases when placed under different pressures. Healthy men, women, and children were purposely infected with debilitating diseases and then cut open while still alive for the Japanese to observe the disease's progress. When the madmen decided to study the disease syphilis, they forced an infected prisoner into sex with a healthy prisoner at gunpoint. But it really gets worse. Women were forcibly impregnated so that experiments could be carried out on them and their babies. No one survived. 
Unit 731 starved, burnt, and electrocuted prisoners, spun them to death in a centrifuge, poisoned them, replaced their blood with animal blood, injected them with seawater, tested experimental weapons on them, and conducted seemingly every other kind of cool experiment that you can think of. A report on frostbite testing read, Prisoners were taken outside in freezing weather and left with exposed arms, periodically drenched with water until frozen solid. After both arms were gone, the doctors moved on to the legs until only a head and torso remained. The victim was then used for plague and pathogens experiments. One of Unit 731's goals was to develop a pathogen they could use to wage biological warfare on Americans. The unit's chief, General Ishii, planned to airdrop plague-carrying fleas into the western United States to cause a pandemic. He wanted to make the Americans think twice before invading Japan, but weeks before he could put his plan into action, his country surrendered. Now, this is by far one of the worst parts of Unit 731's story. Not that they conducted the most psychopathically evil experiments imaginable, but that the Americans let them get away with it. In return for all of their ill-gotten research, General MacArthur secretly agreed to grant all the sadistic nutters at Unit 731 immunity from war crimes prosecution. They all escaped justice, and their research was later found to be amateurish and of no real medical use anyway. While those two examples were probably the most outwardly evil, soldiers of the Japanese Empire committed barbaric war crimes everywhere they went. There was the Nanjing Massacre, where the marauding Japanese army killed between 40,000 and 300,000 people. After killing and capturing nearly all military-aged men, the Japanese soldiers persecuted one of the worst incidences of mass rape in human history. In some cases, women were literally raped to death. The marauding soldiers' favorite targets were high schools. Many other massacres were carried out in China as part of the Three Alls policy. Kill all, loot all, burn all. It was scorched earth on steroids and led to the deaths of roughly 2.7 million Chinese civilians, some from chemical weapons attacks. The policy was personally sanctioned by Emperor Hirohito, which quashes the ridiculous idea that he wasn't a top war criminal too. So if Emperor Hirohito knew about the scale of the atrocities his military was committing and willingly signed off on it, how many others are culpable too? This is a question that modern Japan is still wrestling with and is a common topic in their national debate. But despite greater public recognition for their past crimes, Japan still has a long way to go toward official acknowledgement. Take, for example, the historic Yasukuni Shrine, which functions as a national war memorial for Japanese servicemen who died between 1868 and 1954. There are over 2 million names commemorated on the shrine. 1,068 of those names are convicted war criminals. These were the sadists who set up rape stations, kidnapped girls as young as 11 for sexual enslavement, experimented on living people, and massacred hundreds of civilians. There are also 14 names of Class A war criminals. These are men convicted of masterminding the operations that left millions dead in their wake. There's no acknowledgement at the shrine of what these people did, and what's worse, the museum at the shrine deliberately whitewashes the narrative. It depicts Chinese civilians not running in fear for their lives, but welcoming the Japanese soldiers as liberators. The US is also cast as a warmonger that forced Imperial Japan into conflict by way of economic blockade. This sort of blatant propaganda is not how a nation comes to terms with its history, and the majority of the Japanese public knows this. Many are aware that what is sometimes called the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity War has been heavily propagandized by the far right. But these ultra-nationalists still wield influence in modern Japan. You've heard of the Gestapo and the NKVD before, but what about the Kempatai, whose members were largely responsible for Imperial Japan's atrocities? The Kempatai was Japan's military police and secret police force during the Second World War, and there's no doubt about it, 
they were a bunch of sadistic a-holes. In this video, we're going to be talking about the structure of the Kempai Tai and some of the unforgivable things they got up to during the war. The Kempai Tai wasn't created during the Second World War. The organization was established back in 1881, stealing a bunch of ideas from France's national police force, the National Gendarmerie. At its conception, it consisted of just 349 men. The Kempatai was technically a part of the Imperial Japanese Army, though it also carried out tasks for the Imperial Japanese Navy, the Naomosho, or Home Ministry, and the Shihiyosho, or Ministry of Justice. Because the Japanese Army and Navy hated each other's guts, as we've discussed in a previous video, the Navy had its own military police, the Toketai. This force was far smaller than the Kempatai and existed in part to stop the Japanese Army from sticky beaking in naval affairs. Under the umbrella of the Kempatai, most Kemper found themselves working in administration, police, special duties, or in auxiliary units composed of local forces in Japanese-occupied areas. Kempatai HQs and Field Kempatai, the latter composed of between 315 and 600 personnel, were attached to area armies. Field Kempatai could be broken down into Buntai, or sections, and Bunkentai, or detachments, the smallest Field Kempatai units. In 1901, the Toko, or Special Higher Force, was formed. Also known as the Thought Police, this was a civilian secret police force under the Home Ministry and can be thought of as the civilian counterpart to the Kempatai. The Toko policed internal affairs, suppressing anarchists, socialists, communists, pacifists, student activists, certain religious groups, and anyone who disrespected the Emperor. Via a network of informants, the organization had made over 59,000 arrests by 1936 alone. While the Kempatai and Toko were separate organizations, the Kempatai had its own secret police branch. According to a report from the June 1945 issue of the US Military Intelligence Service's Intelligence Bulletin, practically all members of the Kempe were volunteers both commissioned and enlisted personnel, and the standards for admission to the organization were high. The enlisted men had to hold the rank of Jotahai, or superior private, and had to meet high physical and mental requirements. They also had to be politically reliable. Enlistees went to military police schools or were trained in special units. NCOs and officers were held to a higher standard, needing six or more years of military experience to be considered. Depending on their role, Kempei generally wore Japanese army uniforms, cavalry uniforms, or civilian clothes with a badge underneath. In uniform, Kempei wore a white armband on their left arm which read Kempei. Officers carried a pistol and a saber, while enlisted men got a pistol and a bayonet. Kempei had a range of responsibilities. They concerned themselves with intelligence, counterintelligence, espionage, propaganda, and counterpropaganda, working under disguise at home and in foreign countries, where they often employed local informants. At home, they protected military zones, maintained military discipline, dealt with crimes committed by Japanese army personnel, dealt with conscription laws, maintained security by spying on and arresting possible traitors, defeatists, and people harboring anti-war sentiments, and lastly, crushed threatening rumors and anyone trying to undermine Imperial Japan. Overseas, they seized supplies and food from local populations, managed rations, recruited locals for fun time auxiliary units, maintained rear area security, managed prostitutes, and forcibly recruited sex slaves. Notably, Kempe were also in charge of absolutely ruining the lives of prisoners of war. When it came to methods, Kempei loved a bit of torture, so much so that they had their own handbook on this depraved art form of theirs. While the Kempatai certainly inflicted great suffering before World War II, such as during Japan's annexation of Korea and the early stages of the Second Sino-Japanese War, we're going to focus on their Kempei atrocities in the Second World War. In World War II, at least 11 field Kempatais were active outside of Japan, in Japan's captured and occupied territories, which were mostly in the Pacific. By the end of the war, the United States Army estimated that the Kempatai had more than 35,000 discernible members, with that number estimate climbing to 75,000 to account for undercover personnel and such. After the Japanese 25th Army defeated the Allies in Singapore and seized control of the island in February 1942, the Kempatai set up a headquarters in a YMCA building which became known as Kempatai East District Branch. 
The building was used to administer the 200 regular Kempei and the 1000 auxiliary Kempei in Singapore. It was also a house of pain. Many civilians were tortured here, many of them innocent. On the 10th of October 1943 alone, the Kempetai arrested and tortured 57 civilians they suspected were involved in a raid on Singapore Harbour. Really, the attack was orchestrated by the joint British and Australian Spec Ops Z Special Force. One Singaporean woman, Elizabeth Choi, was held in YMCA for nearly 200 days. They actually let her go in the end, but she suffered no less. In Choi's words, when my interrogators could not get any information out of me, they dragged my husband out, tied him up and made him kneel beside me. Then, in his full view, they stripped me to the waist and applied electric currents to me. The Kempe also erected iron stakes outside the YMCA building and mounted them with severed heads. Sundakan POW camp on Borneo was hell on earth for the allied POWs, mostly Aussie, held there by the Kempetai from July 1942 to May 1945. Putting aside the infamous Sundakan death marches for a moment, Aussie Lieutenant Rod Wells described his own experience with one of the Kempetai's interrogation methods. The interviewer produced a small piece of wood like a meat skewer, pushed that into my left ear and tapped it with a small hammer. I think I fainted sometime after it went through the drum. Sibyl Kathigasu was a nurse living in Japanese-occupied Malaya during the war. Sibyl and her husband provided medical supplies and services to the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army. The Kempetai caught wind of them and arrested them in July 1943. They were tortured for two years. In Siebel's words, They heated iron bars in a charcoal brazier and applied them to my legs and back. They ran a stick between the second and third fingers on both of my hands, squeezing the fingers together and holding them firmly in the air while two men hung from the ends of the cane, making a seesaw of my hands and tearing the flesh between my fingers. Also in Malaya, an unnamed magistrate was arrested by the Kempetai because they suspected he was a spy. The Kempetai tortured him by burying him. As per the magistrate, they buried me in the ground, leaving just my head above ground. I was then made to close my eyes. One of the Kempetai men put his sword against my throat as if to cut it and kept it there for some minutes. After that, I was unburied and left out in the sun for the rest of the day. After that, they shoved the magistrate in a 40 gallon drum of oily water and put the lid on. This didn't kill him though. The Japanese invaded the Dutch East Indian island of Java on the 24th of February 1942 and it was theirs by the 12th of March. This was a disastrous turn of events for Jan Ruff O'Hearn, an Australian woman living on the island with her mother and two sisters. All four women were taken to Emberawa prison camp where they were held for a couple of years. In February 1944, the Kempetai took her from the camp and forced her into sexual slavery in a military brothel, where they kept her for three months before sending her back to Ambarawa. In Jan's words, they dragged us away one by one. I could hear screaming and this large, fat, bald Japanese officer appeared, grinning at me. I put up an enormous fight, but he just dragged me to the bedroom. I never thought suffering could be that terrible. We've covered the dreaded Japanese Biological and Chemical Warfare Unit 731 before, but it's worth mentioning that the Kempetai established this unit, which experimented on living beings in a variety of ways. To name just a few of these so-called experiments, they amputated people's limbs and otherwise operated on them while they were still alive, spun them in centrifuges until they died, exposed them to toxins like pufferfish venom, exposed them to lethal x-ray doses, infected them with horrible diseases, and raped them to spread sexually transmitted infections and force pregnancies for further testing. The Kempetai were responsible for rounding up many of these unfortunate souls. Those were literally just a handful of the atrocities perpetrated by Imperial Japanese military police and the secret police force the Kempetai during the Second World War. They say desperate times call for desperate measures, but how bloody desperate would you need to be to employ children as soldiers? Unfortunately, child soldiers go way back, pretty much to the origins of war, and they're still fighting wars today. World War II was rife with them. From Germany, yes, but other belligerent nations too. 
In this video, we're going to delve into the taboo topic of child soldiers in the Second World War, providing examples from a number of different fighting nations. Before we get stuck into it, we've got to ask, just who is defined as a child? Well, during the Second World War, the definition was a little hairy. It pretty much came down to military laws of each belligerent nation, or just how low they were willing to go in times of, in quotation marks, desperation. Things changed after the war. We often hear about the 1949 Geneva Conventions. In those, as well as the 1989 United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, children aged 15 and older are pretty much good to go to war. In the year 2000, the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child on the Involvement of Children in Armed Conflicts was signed for the first time. This treaty basically prohibits the conscription of children under the age of 18 ensures recruits of the ages of 16 and 17 aren't involved in combat, and ensures that no one younger than 16 can be recruited. The key word in this treaty is optional, but as of September 2020, 170 states have signed it. So just who were the child soldiers of World War II? In October 1941, after officially entering the war in June, the USSR changed its minimum conscription age from 19 to 17 and made all male citizens between 16 and 28 liable for military service. In an order issued in 1942, Stalin adjusted the conscription to include male citizens between the ages of 17 and 30 from the territories he'd liberated from the Germans. Stalin did this because these citizens were, quote, burning with hatred for the invader and a desire to participate in the subsequent liberation of their Soviet motherland with weapons in their hands. While the 17 and 18 year olds among these conscripts were of the legal age to fight according to Soviet law, many Soviet children served in the Red Army in an unofficial capacity. These boys are often referred to as sons of the regiment. Often, they had run away from home to join the fight or had been orphaned by the war. 13-year-old Ivan Gerasimov was among them. After his father was killed at the start of the war, Gerasimov joined the 112th Infantry Division, working as a cook and an ammunition carrier. During the Battle of Stalingrad, after his artillery crew members were killed in front of him, he took up a rifle and started firing on the Germans. During the chaos, one of his hands was blown off and his other arm was badly damaged. Instead of whining about it, young Gerasimov pulled the pin of an anti-tank grenade and threw himself under an enemy tank. But 13 was considered old for the Red Army in the Battle of Stalingrad. The dubious honor of the youngest son of the regiment to serve in the defense of Stalingrad goes to the famous six-year-old Sergei Alishkov, who was adopted by the 142nd Guards Rifle Regiment after his mother and father were executed by the Germans in 1941. He went on to receive a medal for military merit and survive World War II, though he became addicted to cigarettes at an early age, and this prevented him from furthering his military career. Like the USSR, the conscription age into the Imperial Japanese Armed Forces changed as the war dragged on. By 1938, during the Second Sino-Japanese War, just over 44% of Japanese men at a minimum age of 20 were conscripted. By late 1943, all men over the age of 20 were considered, many for kamikaze missions too. Things were looking bad for the Japanese by mid-1945. With the Allies invading the Japanese home island of Okinawa, the Japanese passed laws to form militia units known as the Volunteer Fighting Corps. These units would be composed of male civilians between 15 to 60 and female civilians aged 17 to 40, a demographic with a strength of approximately 28 million though only about 2 million Japanese were actually conscripted. The Volunteer Fighting Corps received basic military training and were expected to fight to the death. While the Battle of Okinawa was over before these units could be implemented in an official capacity, that didn't stop the Japanese army from using them in battle. Recruited from Okinawan schools, some 1,780 schoolboys between 14 and 17 years old were forced on the threat of imprisonment and death into frontline service as members of the Teketsu Kinotai, or the Iron and Blood Imperial Corps. About half of them were killed during the battle. In the lead up to the Battle of Okinawa, 56 schoolgirls from the All Girls School Dani Koto Shokago were assigned as field medics to the Japanese army. Kiku Nakayama was among the 34 who didn't perish on the island. In her words, some soldiers came in with their guts spilling out, 
Some had their entire faces burnt away because of the shrapnel. It was truly hell on earth in every possible way. Although the Germans crushed Poland at the very start of the war, its people continued the fight via a number of resistance organizations right until the end. Among their ranks were Polish younglings, with children between the ages of 12 to 15 working in support roles and children ages 16 to 18 working reconnaissance and sabotage. The Grey Ranks was the code name for the Polish Scouting and Guiding Association during the existence of the Polish underground state. Children between the ages of 12 and 14 received training for support services in their war against the Germans, while children aged 15 to 17 took part in minor sabotage missions, such as distributing propaganda and destroying German symbology. Grey rank members aged 17 and older served in Gruppi Stormove or assault groups, undertaking major sabotage operations against the Germans and fighting in the infamous 1944 Warsaw Uprising. By May 1944, the Grey Ranks numbered 8,359 members. Julian Kulski was just 10 years old when the war came to Poland. Still, he wouldn't just sit idly by while the Germans destroyed everything he loved, so he started sabotaging them. In Kulski's words, I went to the street corners around Zolibos and with a struggle tore down five or six wooden signboards and carried them home on my bicycle. By 13, he was a fully trained member of the Polish resistance, and during an undercover mission into the Warsaw Ghetto, the Gestapo captured him. He was subsequently tortured at Warsaw's Paviak prison. He gave them nothing though, and was rescued just before they sent him to Auschwitz. Kulski went on to fight in the Warsaw Uprising. Of course, this video would be incomplete without the child soldiers who fought for Hitler in the Hitler Youth. The Hitler Youth, or Hitler Jugend, started out as a youth organization through which the Nazis indoctrinated males between the ages of 14 to 18, with boys aged 10 to 14 assigned to the subsidiary organization Deutsches Jungvolk and girls the Bund Deutscher Mädel. From the beginning of the war, members of the Hitler Youth served in auxiliary roles, working to clean up bombed cities and serving in anti-air crews, for instance. By 1943, when things were becoming more desperate for Hitler, he started drawing on the Hitler Youth to fill the ranks of the German military. The 12th SS Panzer Division Hitler Jungend, for example, was an armored division composed primarily of 16 and 17 year old boys from the Hitler Youth. The unit participated in the defense of Normandy and, in this battle, suffered 60% casualties. The indoctrinated boys also committed a number of atrocities massacring 86 French men in Usk, France on the way to Normandy and 11 Canadian POWs at Ardennes Abbey during the Battle of Normandy. Members of the Deutsches Jungvolk served too. Among them was Alfred Czech, who at 12 years of age took his father's farm cart and used it to help a dozen German soldiers injured by mortars to safety. For this action, he was awarded the Iron Cross and a banquet was held in his name. During the banquet, the Nazis asked young Alfred if he wanted to go home or join the military. He chose the military, and they put him through an accelerated training program. During combat, he was shot through the lungs, but survived, only to be captured by the Soviets. Alfred was released from prison in 1947 at just 14 years of age. German children also fought in the Volkssturm, or People's Army, with males aged 16 to 60 conscripted into this last-ditch national militia established in September 1944. In reality, boys and girls as young as eight served in this ragtag force, notably in the fall of Berlin alongside the Hitler Youth. Australian and British soldiers suffered, laughed and died side by side in countless hellholes throughout the Second World War. While positivity and mateship can get you through some seriously tough times, they couldn't save the Aussies and Brits whom the Japanese subjected to the misery of the Sandakan death marches in the final year of the war. In this video, we tell that atrocious tale. In February 1942, Imperial Japan's 25th Army crossed the Johor Strait onto the island of Singapore and crushed the defending Allied forces so thoroughly that they surrendered some 80,000 troops. Many of these men were consigned to forced labor, which, under Japanese supervision, was synonymous with a slow, agonizing death. In July, 1500 Aussies were shipped to Sandakan on the island of Borneo, 
A further 500 Australians and 770 British joined the first group the following year. Held at Sundakan POW camp, these men were forced at gunpoint to build the Japanese a military airfield without heavy machinery, using hand tools instead. The conditions were terrible. Before it was a POW camp, Sandakan was an experimental farm owned by the North Borneo Chartered Company. During the war, it was divided into an Australian compound, a British compound, and a site for Japanese guards to live and chill when they weren't tormenting their prisoners. In charge of Sandakan was Japanese Lieutenant Sumi Hoshijima, chosen because he was a military engineer capable of building an airfield, and he was also a huge, huge a-hole. When new POWs arrived at the camp, this is what this career sadist said to them. You will work until your bones rot under the tropical sun of Borneo. You will work for the emperor. If any of you escape, I will pick out three or four and shoot them. The war will last for 100 years. We'll call him Hoshi now, because why not? The fences surrounding the compounds were electrified and fixed with barbed wire. If a prisoner was caught stealing food, the guards would throw them into a wooden cage without food and in minimal clothes, often just a loincloth. The mosquitoes were well fed at least. No matter what, the prisoners could only use the loo twice per day. The guards also punished them with methods of torture involving electricity and water. Other methods included hammering meat skewers into their ears. Such was the fate that befell Lieutenant Rod Wells, who described the experience as such. I think I fainted sometime after it went through the drum. I remember the last excruciating sort of pain, and I must have gone out for some time because I was revived with a bucket of water. Eventually it healed, but of course I couldn't hear with it. I've never been able to hear since. It didn't matter if the prisoners were sick or starving or wounded or a second from dead. They were forced to break their backs day in and day out, working their hands to the bone to build an airfield that would undoubtedly be used to wage war against fellow Aussies and Brits. In August 1943, the Japanese further crushed the prisoners' morale by removing Australian and British officers from the camp, sending them to suffer in Batu Lintang camp instead. According to an article on the Australian government's Anzac portal, 885 Australians and British perished in Sandakan. And it does seem that the Allies knew what was going on there, for in October 1944, they started bombing the airfield. They also planned a rescue operation codenamed Kingfisher, but never bloody went through with it. Just why Operation Kingfisher fell through remains unknown. Either way, by January 1945, the Japanese airfield was so messed up that Hoshi, now a captain, decided he would move his operation to the town of Ranau instead. It didn't matter that Renal was 260 kilometers or 160 miles away, through mountain ranges and sweltering jungles and swamps, nor that his prisoners were already on death's door. And so began the Sandakan death marches. The first group of POWs left in January. There were 455 of them. They had to carry all of the Japanese guards' equipment and were only given four days' rations. The journey required nine. Along the way, prisoners dropped like flies. If they couldn't keep up, the Japanese just killed them. Australian private Keith Botterill, one of the Sandakan death marches survivors, described it better than we ever could. I've seen men shot and bayoneted to death because they could not keep up with the party. No effort whatsoever was made to bury them. There was nothing we could do. We climbed this mountain about 30 miles out from Manau, and we lost five men on that mountain in half a day. They shot five of them because they couldn't continue. But I just kept plodding along. It was a dense jungle. I was heartbroken, but I thought there was safety in numbers. I just kept going. It doesn't seem that any of the POWs escaped during this first march. When the survivors arrived at Renau, however, where they were forced to build a temporary camp, some men tried. What follows is an anecdote featured in an article by the Australian War Memorial. Gunner Albert Cleary, a young man from Geelong, tried to escape into the jungle. Recaptured after a week, he was beaten and tied to a log. For 11 days, guards beat him, spat, and urinated on him. If you escape, the same thing will happen to you, a Japanese officer warned. At last, when he was close to death, 
the prisoners were allowed to free him. They carried him to a creek, washed and placed him in a hut where he died. By May, just 30 of the POWs from the first march were alive. The aforementioned Keith Botterill was among them, but only because of his comrade Richard Murray, who took full responsibility for some rice the pair had stolen from the Japanese. In answer to the theft, the Japanese bayoneted Murray and tossed his corpse into a bomb crater. By the time the second march arrived on the 24th of June, just six prisoners from the first march were alive. The dead having either succumbed to starvation, disease, including dysentery, which would have been a horrible way to go, or Japanese bayonets. A further four, including Botteril, had somehow managed to escape into the jungle where the locals took them in. After the first march departed Sandakan, Japanese captain Takakua Takuo was left in charge of the camp. He sent 536 prisoners to Renau on the 29th of May. Their journey took far longer than the first, a march of 26 days, and only 183 of them actually made it to Renau. 142 were Australian and 41 were British. Two Aussies managed to escape into the jungle along the way, gunner Owen Campbell and bombardier Richard Braithwaite. The locals took them in as they had taken in Renau's four escapees. Now only some 250 POWs remained in Sandakan. On the 9th of June 1945, the Japanese departed with 75 of them on a third and final march. The rest were left to starve to death in the camp. Some resorted to cannibalism to survive, but all of them ultimately died. So too did every prisoner on the final march. Over at Renau, every single POW perished too weak to work and thus shot by the Japanese. Of the six Aussies who escaped, two ultimately died as a result of their maltreatment, Botteril not included. The Sandakan death marches are largely considered to be the most heinous atrocity inflicted upon Australian soldiers during the Second World War. After the Japanese surrender in the end of the war, the Allies put Hoshi and the equally sadistic Takokua on trial for war crimes. Both of these miscreants were found guilty and executed. People have since then hiked the route between Sandakan and Renau to both honour the men who died upon it and to understand, at least to some degree, the hell they experienced. So had you heard of the Sandakan death marches before today? Do you know anything about them we didn't cover in this video? Any anecdotes that illustrate just how bad they were? Would you ever consider walking from Sandakan to Renau to honour these men? The Battle of Stalingrad was the bloodiest battle the world has ever seen. In scale, losses, and sheer brutality, nothing comes close. The battle irrevocably turned the tide of the war in the East and ensured Hitler's plans for European domination would never come to pass. But how well do you know the battle? In this video, we take a look at the hellhole that was Stalingrad, presenting 13 lesser known facts along the way. The city of Stalingrad straddles the Volga River in southern Russia. Its position on a river bend effectively gives the city control over river traffic, which was critical during the Second World War. Hitler's war machine was a thirsty beast and needed vast quantities of oil to keep running. The oil-rich Caucasus region was a prize Hitler would give just about anything to secure. Stalin knew this. He could not afford to lose the strategic city to the Germans and was prepared to commit all he had to defend it. Additionally, the propaganda value of losing Stalin's city would have been catastrophic for the Allied cause. The attack began on August 23rd, 1942 with a massive air raid. Falling bombs didn't discriminate between soldiers and civilians. The Luftwaffe scorched the city with fire bombs and the smoke column stretched 3.5 kilometers into the sky. The city was rendered to rubble and roads were buried under meters thick piles of concrete. But this gave the Soviets an unexpected advantage. With the roads impassable, the Germans could not easily bring their superior armor to bear. They would have to clear the city the hard way. The Soviet defense was desperate. Everyone was mobilized. Reportedly to inspire the defenders, Stalin forbade the evacuation of much of Stalingrad's civilian population. Women and children were put to work digging trenches and constructing earthworks, while men were enlisted into workers' militias. Many of these conscripts weren't even given rifles and were sent to the front unarmed. This wasn't the case, however, for regular troops. 
This was 1942, but the Soviets were fairly progressive when it came to gender equality. Everyone was permitted to fight and die for the motherland. The all-female volunteer 1077th anti-aircraft regiment put up ferocious resistance against a German attack, their leveled anti-aircraft guns doing deadly work. The German 16th Panzer Division recorded the following. Right until afternoon, we had to fight shot for shot against 37 anti-aircraft positions manned by tenacious fighting women until all were destroyed. In the industrial district, the Stalingrad tractor factory kept producing tanks while under attack. Their tanks rolled off the production line, crudely finished and unpainted, and then onto the front line. Still, the factory kept producing war machines right up until the Germans burst through the front doors. Soviet commanders pulled their troops back to concentric rings of defense inside the wrecked city, but continued launching counterattacks, often at horrendous cost. The Soviet 13th Guards Rifle Division was one such unlucky unit. The 10,000 strong force attacked the hill at Mamayev Korgan and captured railway station number one. The Germans counterattacked, retaking the railway station. The 13th attacked again, forcing their retreat. This happened no less than 14 times in the space of six hours, in which time the 13th was worn down to just 320 men. As August bled into September, the Soviets lost more of Stalingrad to the Axis. They were pushed back to a tiny foothold on the banks of the Volga, but from here, they would not be dislodged. Stalin had given his infamous Order 227, ordering no unauthorized retreats on penalty of death. Fresh reserves were brought in from Siberia and Central Asia, swelling the ranks of the Red Army. These brand new units crossed the Volga under heavy fire from German artillery and aircraft, only to be hurled onto the front line once they arrived. Their average life expectancy was just 24 hours. But as the Soviets faced mounting losses, they adopted new tactics. Snipers infested the city's rubble, taking out officers, radio men, and enemy snipers from well-concealed heights. Collapsed buildings provided perfect cover, and the constant blanket of smoke haze further obscured them from view. Deep underground, the Soviets fortified Stalingrad's sewer network and used it to transport men and material. Sometimes, Soviet platoons would feign retreat, escaping into the sewers so they could reappear behind unsuspecting Axis patrols. But the Germans soon got wise to this trick. They fortified the sewers as well, turning them into a new and particularly hellish battleground. Bullets fired into the compacted brickwork could ricochet anywhere, so soldiers were encouraged to take the enemy in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Germans soon learned to fear the sewers. They named the battle down there the Rattenkrieg. Soviet tactics changed above ground too. Long rifles were discarded in favor of submachine guns wherever possible, and AT rifles were handed out liberally. The Soviets also developed a network of fortified blockhouses from ruined factories and houses. They were compartmentalized. If one fell to a fierce Axis attack, the others could still hold firm. Attacking one of these positions could be a death sentence as Axis forces had to contend with knife-wielding Soviets in the sewers, vengeful snipers concealed in the buildings, hidden machine gun positions, and streets choked with rubble. Even if they captured a single room in a house, the Soviets would burrow through adjacent walls and attack them from another angle, or come through the roof or floor. One common joke amongst the Wehrmacht soldiers was that they could fight a battle to take the kitchen while the Soviets still held the living room. It's difficult to imagine a worse battlefield. But somehow, things did get worse. Winter closed in and ice prevented larger boats from crossing the Volga. The Germans pushed on, capturing 90% of the city and restricting the Soviets to just a few small zones. Food for the surviving civilians was taken, and city dwellers consumed rats to survive. Attrition ate away at both the Axis and Soviet forces, but replacements were far more easily found in the Red Army. The Luftwaffe flew an average of over 900 missions per day over the city, bombing, scouting, and covering advancing forces on the ground. This took a serious toll on their engines, something the flyboys shared with the beleaguered Axis tankers. The men were also reaching their limits. Croatian, Romanian, Hungarian, and Italian soldiers fought alongside the Germans throughout the battle, but they were rarely as well supplied as Hitler's men. They received fewer reinforcements, 
and while they demonstrated extreme bravery on many occasions, the months of fatigue had taken their toll. German commanders pulled their allies back from the front in late 1942 to cover the Axis flanks. Paulus, the chief German commander of the battle, wanted to pull back further, but his hands were tied. In his own words, there is still the order whereby no commander of an army group or an army has the right to relinquish a village, even a trench, without Hitler's consent. He was also concerned about the weakness of his flanks, a weakness Zhukov recognized and intended to exploit. Recycling the same plan he had used to defeat the Japanese at Kalkan Gol four years earlier, Zhukov launched an attack on the Axis flanks on either side of the city. It was spearheaded by newly manufactured tanks churned out in ever increasing numbers right across the Soviet Union. Behind the tanks were over a million soldiers. It happened on November 19th. Soviet tanks flattened the 3rd Romanian Army. The 4th Romanian Army was next and a ring of steel encircled the German 6th Army inside the city. They didn't know it, but only 2% of the surrounded men would ever see home again. Paulus requested permission to break out, but Hitler turned him down. He ordered the force, numbering 22 divisions, to be resupplied by air. Even with every available plane carrying supplies, only 105 of the 750 tons necessary for survival were delivered daily. The 6th Army withered and began to die. The relief from Axis air attacks reinvigorated the Soviet Air Force and they preyed upon the heavily laden transport planes. Within six weeks, they had reduced German air strength in the east by a third. This, however, was one of the few offensive operations that the Soviets undertook. They knew they had the Germans pinned, so why risk lives doing what starvation could do for them? The Soviet news tightened, but the Germans continued resisting until January 1943. Paulus asked for permission to surrender again and again, reporting to Hitler that 18,000 wounded were without the slightest aid of bandages and medicine. The Führer responded, What a heroic drama of German history! At January's end, they surrendered. Hitler never forgave Paulus, vowing never to appoint a field marshal again. The Battle of Stalingrad cost the lives of roughly 2 million people and effectively terminated German ambitions in the East. The Red Army was galvanized and their counterstroke would force the Wehrmacht all the way back to their heartland. General Chukov, one of the Soviet high commanders, noted, Remembering the defense of Stalingrad, I can't overlook the very important question about the role of women in war, in the rear, but also at the front. Equally with men, they bore all the burdens of combat life and together with us men, they went all the way to Berlin. It's always nice to grab a souvenir or two to remember a holiday. Keychains, t-shirts, jewelry, gold teeth, human skulls, you know, the usual. Those last two might have surprised you, but they sure didn't surprise the US customs authorities during and after the Second World War. Many GIs returned home with the bones of dead Japanese soldiers or posted them to their wives and girlfriends from the field. The practice was common and some would say inevitable. After all, why shouldn't they mutilate Japanese corpses when the Japanese were doing the same to them? Well, that was one take at least, but in this video we're going to delve far deeper into this gruesome subject. You might say we're going to get to the marrow of it. The practice of removing and keeping human body parts has been going on for thousands of years. Amazonian tribes shrunk the severed heads of their enemies. Samurai cut the noses from Korean slain in the 16th century Japanese invasion. European colonists scalped Native Americans, and they scalped them in turn. While body parts were kept for a variety of purposes, they were often displayed as trophies, as tokens of victory and warnings to would-be foes. This all sounds pretty primitive, to be honest, so why were the Americans doing it in the 1940s? What exactly was going on? Well, it all started in the Pacific, where Imperial Japanese and US forces clashed most. It's unclear exactly when it started or exactly why, but American soldiers sought out three Japanese body parts in particular, ears, gold teeth, and skulls. According to American historian John Dower, ears were the most common trophy taken, probably due to the ease with which an ear can be removed. After the war, 
US Marine Donald Fall described how Marines on Guadalcanal would stick Japanese ears to their belts, for instance. The taking of gold teeth is pretty self-explanatory, but we can't go on without mentioning a quote collated in grim stuff. As for skulls, they took a bit more preparation. The flesh had to be removed, of course, so most trophy hunters took the skulls from corpses that had already started to decay. According to historian Niall Ferguson, boiling the flesh off Japanese skulls was not an uncommon practice. In fact, there's photos of American soldiers undertaking this procedure. But why go to all this bloody effort? As it turns out, US soldiers mutilated the Japanese dead for a variety of reasons. One of the big ones was revenge. Returning to veteran Donald Fall's description of trophy taking on Guadalcanal, he said, We found a lot of pictures of Marines that had been cut up and mutilated. It was after this incident that Fall started to see Marines pinning Japanese ears to their belts. To quote Fall again, You get into a nasty frame of mind in combat. You'd find a dead Marine that the Japs had booby trapped, and they mutilated the dead. We began to get down to their level. It probably didn't help that the Japanese were depicted as vermin in US propaganda. According to James Weingartner's Trophies of War, to many Americans, the Japanese adversary was no more than an animal. This notion was supported by a US war correspondent who said, I gather that the Japanese were looked upon as subhuman and repulsive, the same way some people feel about cockroaches or mice. The aforementioned author Niall Ferguson went as far as to liken the American view of the Japanese the German view of Slavs in the USSR, as Untermenschen. Some anecdotes suggest that American GIs mutilated dead Japanese because they themselves were treated as animals. In other words, the horrors of combat had reduced them to savagery. In Darwin and International Relations, on the evolutionary origins of war and ethnic conflict, author Bradley Thayer refers to a quote by Guadalcanal campaign veteran Or Marion. At daybreak, a couple of our kids, bearded, dirty, skinny from hunger, slightly wounded by bayonets, clothes worn and torn, whack off three heads and jam them on poles facing the side of the river. Their colonel sees this and says, what are you doing? You're acting like animals. A dirty, stinking young kid says, that's right, colonel, we are animals. We live like animals, we eat and are treated like animals. What the f do you expect? In Skull Trophies of the Pacific War, Transgressive Objects of Remembrance, author Simon Harrison offers another interesting explanation as to why American GIs mutilated Japanese corpses. In Harrison's words, hunting was an important symbolic affirmation of American white male identity. It can have some qualities of a rite of passage for adolescent boys. Many servicemen brought this ideology with them into combat with an enemy which many of them viewed as subhuman. If we're hearing Harrison properly, it could be argued that some American GIs claimed Japanese body parts in the same way they might claim the head of a deer and mount it on their wall. Of course, some Americans simply claimed Japanese body parts as souvenirs, as proof that they had been there, while others took body parts so they could trade or sell them. For example, in Skull Trophies of the Pacific War, Harrison refers to a soldier who made a string of beads from the teeth of Japanese soldiers and intended to sell this gruesome item of jewelry when he returned to the States. Another more famous example is that of Natalie Nickerson, whose naval officer boyfriend sent her a Japanese skull autographed by him and a dozen of his mates. Some words were inscribed on the skull as well. This is a good they said, a dead one picked up on the New Guinea beach. An image of Nickerson with this skull, which she named Tojo, appeared in a May 1944 issue of Life magazine and her boyfriend was ultimately reprimanded, albeit not severely. It very much seems that some loved ones back in the US were encouraging this sort of behavior in American GIs. Harrison refers to two examples of this. The first featured in an April 1943 issue of a Baltimore newspaper, the second in a Detroit newspaper. The Baltimore paper ran a story of a local mother seeking permission for her son to send her a Japanese ear, which she wanted to nail to her front door, while the Detroit paper ran a story about an underage lad who bribed his chaplain with the promise of Japanese ears if the chaplain didn't disclose the lad's true age when he went to enlist in the army. So, the American public didn't seem to have too much of an issue with corpse mutilation, but what about the US military and what about the Japanese? 
With the American military, it seems they weren't bothered by it, turned a blind eye to it, or were concerned with it only on paper. In September 1942, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet Chester W. Nimitz issued an order that condemned body parts as souvenirs, while, according to the aforementioned Ormarion, Marines caught doing this would face a court-martial. In January 1944, the Joint Chiefs of Staff put their foot down, issuing a directive against body mutilation. Still, the practice continued. That photo of Natalie Nickerson and Tojo in Life magazine, for instance, was published after the JCS narrative. And Harrison refers to an account by a pioneer aviator named Charles Lindbergh, who recorded a conversation he had with the Marine officer in the Marshall Islands in August 1944. In Lindbergh's words, the officer said he'd seen a number of Japanese bodies from which an ear or nose had been cut off. Our boys cut them off to show their friends for fun, or to dry and take them back to the States, said the officer. We found one Marine with a Japanese head. He was trying to get the ants to clean the flesh off the skull, but the odor got so bad we had to take it away from him. It's the same story everywhere I go. This anecdote is important because it shows that, rather than reprimanding the Marine, the officer simply confiscated the skull. In Harrison's words, the JCS directive seemed to have been implemented only partially and unevenly by local commanders. Returning to Charles Lindbergh, the practice of taking Japanese body parts as souvenirs had become so common that, when passing through Hawaiian customs in 1944, they asked him if he was carrying any bones in his luggage. It had become routine at this point. Mostly though, they were looking for what they termed green skulls, which were skulls that hadn't been cured properly. Imagine trying to get one of those bad boys through customs today. As for the Japanese, the mutilation only reinforced the portrayal of American soldiers in Japanese propaganda, which sought to demonize them. We discussed this topic in detail in our video on Japanese perspectives of American soldiers, but this quote by historian Edwin Hoyt surmises the Japanese perspective. Thought of a Japanese soldier's skull becoming an American ashtray was as horrifying in Tokyo as the thought of an American prisoner used for bayonet practice was in New York. But what's your opinion? Did you know that American soldiers mutilated Japanese dead during the Second World War? Do you know anything about this topic we didn't cover in this video? And lastly, do you think the Americans should have been punished more severely? Let us know all your thoughts and opinions in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.